members uh, and welcome to the Planning and Development Management Committee of the 13th of March 2019. Uh, as you can see, we have a full public gallery this morning, so I would like to also extend a warm welcome to members of the public to this meeting. Um, planning is often emotive, sometimes contentious, and I would, with respect, like to remind members of the public that this is a meeting in public, but it's not a public meeting, and the contributions from people should be by the deputations only. With that, I think, let me introduce the top table. Uh, I am Councillor Bob Braun. I normally sit as Vice Convener, but uh, this morning I am acting as Convener. To my right is Mrs. Conliffe and Mr. Scott from Planning. To my left is Mr. Elliot from Legal Services. To his left is Councillor McCall, who is normally Convener, but has taken the second seat today. And to her left is Mr. Danny Williams. I could ask, first of all, do we have any apologies? Uh, yes, Vice Convener, we have an uh, apology from Councillor James with Councillor Rill and with substituting, and we have further apologies from Councillor Coates and uh, Councillor Barnacle. Thank you very much. Members, do we have any declarations of interest this morning? No. No. Okay. Uh, we have several deputations to hear today. Um, are we all in agreement to hear the deputations? Yes, yes thank you very much. Uh, and the next part is the minutes from the previous meeting. Are we in agreement with those? And could I ask that we agree to sign those? Agreed. Agreed. And with that, members, we will move on to the first application. Uh, this is uh, an erection of 51 retirement flats and cycle store Formational Park and Associated Works at land formerly known as the Wheel Inn, 37 Angus Road, Schoon. And I'm going to ask Mr. Scott to introduce. Thank you very much, Vice Convener. Yes, so the proposal, as members may be aware, the, this is the proposed site plan which shows that the two blocks of flatted properties, uh, block one is the largest within the centre of the site, which is in the location of where the existing Wheel Inn facility is. And that would accommodate 38 um, private properties. The block to the south is block two, which is smaller in nature, and it would accommodate 13 units, which would be the affordable housing provision. The site itself is accessed from Angus Road, which is on the, the right of the shop there, which is the A94. That's the principal access to the site, which is being retained and enhanced as part of this proposal, which would lead directly to the block one and the two primary car parking areas. To the north of the site is Stormont Road, and there's an existing site access, which you can see now, uh, provides the secondary access. It wouldn't provide a through route through the site, but would provide access to the third car parking area. There appears to be a technological problem with the slides moving back and forth. That will be the last slide as well, so I'll, I'll pick up on a few points uh, when we get there. What I'll do now is take through a few photos in terms of the context and the site itself. This is the site access at the A94, as I described earlier. So it's the existing access, which is proposed to be retained uh, and improved to provide access to the new flatted development. As you'll see in the forecourt there, there's a large car parking area at present, and the wheel in, uh, former wheel in, in the distance is also visible. This is taken further to the north. This is the junction of the A94 with Stormont Road. So it's looking down Stormont Road. The white building in shot that you can see there is the GP surgery, which immediately bounds the application site to the north. And just beyond that, that's for the secondary access, which takes into what would be the third car parking area. This access is the secondary access I referred to at the site of the GP surgery, which is currently used at present as a through route on the site. But as I said, it would actually be proposed to be retained as a second access for access to the third car parking area. And then there are pedestrian linkages thereafter through the site. This is taken from the south of the site. Uh, it's not a vehicular access. This is a pedestrian access that exists at present, which goes from, uh, this is looking down Union Road with Balformer Road to the left of shot here. So these are private roads, but as I say, it's well used in terms of uh, residential use moving through the site and it would be retained for pedestrian access to the existing, sorry, to the proposed development to Schoon in the wider area. Now this is a reverse shot effectively from the same location. This is the path that currently leads into the, the grounds of the former pub and restaurant. So you can see there that there's a, an open space area 
uh, and the, the last of extensions to the former wheel in. This would be the location of where block two uh, would be located. And also this is where the substantial area of uh, open space proposed as part of this provision. In the region of 2,100 square metres of open space has been provided within the proposal. Uh, and as I say, it's going to be predominantly within this area at the southern part of the site. Taking us back to the forecourt, this is just beyond the main access, so it, again, it just gives you an, an impression of the scale and size of the site. The site itself is 7,100 square metres in size. Uh, with the removal of the building, the, the new built form, this would be roughly at the location we'd see block one to the right-hand side and block two, just beyond uh, similarly following the line of the existing building. And that would amount to about 26% of the site being developed, and this would be a car parking and open space area. This is the, the, the last slide. It's actually a 3D visualization of what block one would look like. So from a similar location, albeit slightly further south from the last slide. So it shows you the elevational treatment uh, as well as the scale and appearance of the building. So the proposal as presented has presented uh, a, a building in a staggered form to break up its mass. Uh, and again, it's uh, a three story in height, albeit now with a pitch roof, which replicates obviously of a traditional nature. As you can see, there clearly is a, an innovation in terms of it a modern uh, design in terms of the brick, the render, and the appearance of the windows. Uh, and the elevation itself has been broken up with uh, material changes to provide visual separation to try and show <laughs> as though it would be a series of townhouses, again, to further reduce the mass and scale of the building. And just beyond the left-hand side of the shot, that's actually the start of block two as well, which would be a two-story building. This takes us back to the proposed site plan. Um, just to highlight on this plan, you will see that there is, a, apologies, appears to be a problem with this drawing. Um, there is a, a line through the site. That's not a proposal as such. That's actually the location of the barrel drain, which is a, a surface water drainage facility within Schoon itself. Uh, and there's a hatched area in and around that. That's just showing that there is a development standoff. No development is taking place on or within the uh, exclusion zone, if you like, of the barrel drain but it will potentially form part of the surface water drainage solution for the site. Thank you, Fites and Bino. Thank you, Mr. Scott. We have a deputation on this case. Uh, if I could ask uh, Mr. Miles and Mr. Dillon to come forward, please. And Mr. Steele, who is the applicant. Gentlemen, you have five minutes to speak and we'll give you a warning when there's one minute left to go. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Um, my name's Mark Miles. I, I'm from Bidwells. I've been the planning consultant on this project. I'm um, joined today with Jason Steele from Jimmy Fowler Residential, the applicant, and Keith Dillon from IDP Architects, who are here to answer any questions as well. Uh, just a brief statement, really. Um, we recognise the contribution that's been made from all interested parties, um, objectors, consultees, and with the planning department throughout the entire planning process. Uh, which started with the submission of the plan around 10 months ago. We therefore very much welcome the recommendation for approval of this revised plan application. We consider the committee report to be very thorough as it asset addresses all of the relevant planning policy issues and matters that have been raised throughout the process and also within the letters of representation. We're also content that each of the, the 15 proposed conditions satisfy the relevant tests for applying conditions as set out in the circular. We therefore encourage you to support the recommendation of the officers and approve the plan application on the basis that the particular needs housing and the residential assisted living accommodation is in accordance with the development plan and therefore we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, could you stay there for a moment just if we have any questions, please? Members, do we have any questions? Councillor Simpson. Thank you very much indeed, Vice Convener. Uh, thank you, Mr. Miles, for, for those comments. Uh, I have what may seem like a silly question for you, but it, begins, it starts with line one, where it says the proposal is for the Direction 51 retirement flats. Uh, what reason have we to believe that these are retirement flats? And given the age profile of the committee, be careful what you say about people aged over 55. But, um, um, the plan application description um, clearly sets out that requirement, which is also covered by, I think, condition number um, two or three. Yeah, condition number two restricts the future occupation of the accommodation to both the, the um, 
private accommodation, but also the affordable housing accommodation to the same age restriction. Can I just add that um, typically the, the residents of uh, this, these types of developments are, are, are much older than 55 uh, and tend to be in their 70s uh, and it tends to be a widow. That's, uh, uh, that's your typical occupant, if you like, of this type of accommodation. May ask a supplementary, right? Please, I, don't, I don't wish to labour the point, but I hear what you say. But there's going to be 74 bedrooms in this development. Um, people over 55, and even some people in their 70s, still have gainful employment. That makes 74 bedrooms. That could be 184, uh, 100, 100, 148 people. And if they were to make a number of car journeys. I would suggest that the, the, the figure were more like 888 car journeys, possibly, rather than the much smaller figure suggested. And I have a concern that we have no guarantee that the people who are buying these flats are going to be retired in any way, in any shape or form. Would, would you agree that's the case? We have no guarantee that these people will be retired. Well, in, in terms of the definition of retirement, yeah, as you say, there could be people who are still working but generally there's 28 one bedroom flats and 23 two bedroom flats. And the parking requirements are dictated obviously by transportation department and they've satisfied their needs. And um, a further question if I may, if I speak, and then I'll tell you me, it'll be me I think. <laughs> um, I, I, the, the car parking arrangements here are, are unusual, I will agree. Um, but given that this area has traditionally been used as the constant overflow and staff parking for the doctor's surgery, the car parking for uh, local residents, and the main car park and the main reason that the new church in Scuden remains open as a parking area, uh, when the Harris fencing goes up, Scuden is going to experience a major um, traffic and parking problem. Can you give us, whilst I realise that it is um, not within uh, this committee's um, remit to, to, to compel you to do anything, can you give us any indication if you have tried in any way to seek um, other, other car parking arrangements in the area, given the problems that I would foresee here? Um, well, I mean, it's, it's always been recognised that that obviously is the current situation, which is an informal basis on on the back of previous owners allowing that to happen and probably as a part of the fact that the wheel in laterally was not running at full capacity obviously um, but I think it's also always been recognised that that's not an issue for this current plan application and if there's parking requirements for other users within the village then it's those other uses and those other sites that are required to meet those demands specifically. I would just to add, we did um, we did try to uh, come up with some alternative arrangements. Uh, I mean, we, we realised this was an issue. Obviously, community council raised it as an issue. Um, I think um, the, we had meetings with various parties in the town, uh, and nobody wanted to share any parking. So, uh, uh, yes, we recognised it was an issue, but uh, and something we did try to address. But it's out with our gift, I'm afraid. Um, Councillor Wilson, another question? Thanks, Vice Convener. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, on page 27 of the papers that we've got, um, there was reference to a previous application for 55 retirement living apartments, and then obviously a reference to the current application for 51. What, and could you advise the committee what you feel is the change in height and massing that makes a difference from um, an application which the officers <coughs> found unsupportable um, for 55 units um, to the current situation where we've got with um, 50, 50 51, 51 units. 51. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as a, as a um, architect, we, we did a lot of work uh, with uh, the council um, to try and get favorable proposals. Um, basically, that reduced the height from four stories to, to, to three stories. And we further reduce that by putting room and roof accommodation. So, um, as we call it, two and a half story accommodation, albeit it's it's three stories uh, as it as it currently is on that block one. 
and the block two is is two story so again fitting in with that sort of village esque you know um, uh, appeal of the of the surrounding area so we did a lot of work to look at the massing a lot of 3d work as well to illustrate all angles of the scheme to uh, to ensure that it did fit within the the existing uh, uh, street team uh, just a follow-up to that are there any other three-story buildings in the vicinity there are uh, two and a half story uh, buildings and also the topography of the site. There are higher um, topography areas within there, sort of further north, uh, which uh, in terms of streetscape massing do, um, do, do have a similar uh, building height. A, another question, perhaps Vice Convener. Drainage is an issue in Schoon, right? Um, and you've referred to the, uh, the introduction referred to the, the barrel drain described in many ways as a water course or a drain or a um, various descriptions do you consider your proposal deal adequately with all the drainage issues that inevitably this substantial number of units will will provide given the the likely population that will will reside here if, if it's approved well again um, uh, our consultants have done a lot of work with this and been liaising with Scottish Water and with um, the local uh, council flooding officer, there is not an objection from either party. Uh, and actually, there is a recognition that we're improving the situation uh, and we're providing betterment. Uh, we are uh, we, we are um, refurbing or renewing the element of the barrel drain that runs through our site. Um, and also we'll be restricting the flow of surface water into the barrel drain. It's currently unrestricted at the moment and there's a large surface area, uh, as you know, from the car park. Uh, uh, we'll be restricting that uh, to five litres per second, no matter what the weather. Uh, and obviously um, there will be attenuation tanks under the car park and um, what's called, I think it's called the hydro break. And, uh, to restrict the flow of water to five litres a second into the barrel drain, no matter what the weather. Vice I just wonder if I could ask a supplementary on that. Please These do. proposals that you've got for retention on site, have you another site um, with a similar development where this has worked? Or is this, un is this proven technology or unproven technology? No, I think it's, it's well recognised and attenuation is, uh, is common. Uh, yeah. So it's not untested, is, is what I'm saying. Right, but you've no, you can't give us an example of a development where you've already introduced this type of flood attenuation and and it, and it's worked. That's what. Well, that's there's changed. many developments. Yeah. Sorry. There's many developments where where that's been provided. Well, could you give us an example of one that you've you've been involved in, please? Um, Isla, Isla Road in Perth for a previous uh, company, McCarthy and Stone, is one where where we've done definitely did that as well. Okay, and and it works. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm on page 41 now, Vice Convener. One more question. One more. Okay. I can see that you're saying one more. Yeah. Yep. Um, the figures given there for vehicle movements, um, do you think that they are realistic and were these your calculation? I know they've taken advice from our, our transport planning officers, but um, given the number of, of units that are proposed, the number of visitors that are likely to be in the vicinity, um, both staying overnight and also day visitors, do you think the number of movements and the number of car parking spaces are realistic? Um, yes, in short. Um, th we've obviously discussed at length between the transport engineers and the council's transportation department in terms of scoping th the extent of the transportation study in the first place, modelling using you know, recognised examples from the past of similar types of development, traffic movements, and based on the fact that you've got to assess it on the the basis of the, the current use as if it were open, that's the way that the, the whole transport assessment was undertaken and that was clearly accepted and agreed with the transportation department. Thank you. Councillor Grosdale. Thank you, Vice Convener. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, 
this is obviously a, um, a, a significant investment for yourselves in, in, in this location. As, as part of the development of the proposal, you have no doubt undertaken um, considerable market research in terms of uh, demand for uh, this type of facility in this location. Can you say a little bit about that, just to give me a flavour for the level of de demand in the area? Well, um, I can just say that uh, but, uh, the demographics speak for themselves, really. Um, there is <laughs> there is a vastly ageing population with uh, no specialist housing being built in response. Um, we feel uh, Scone and Perth uh, in general is, is one of these areas where it will be particularly uh, a high level of retirees, 70s, and 80 year olds and we want to build housing to meet that demand yeah. and just to add to that that you know the council's strategic housing investment plan that that's one of the sort of priority groups that's identified in terms of the, mm -hmm. the demographic changes thank you thank you thank you do we have any other questions councillor anderson thank you very soon Vina. um uh, uh, gentlemen, uh, could you, uh, this is, uh, I believe, assisted accommodation to the description. Um, does that mean uh, there, uh, there would be a, a warden on site and uh, a community room? Would it be that sort of design a building? Uh, yes, there is uh, a communal lounge on the ground floor and also there's uh, uh, one on the top floor as well. Yeah, like a sunroom or a... Uh, and also, yes, there would be a day manager uh, 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 who would be there in office hours. Uh, and out of hours, there would be a 24-hour call line. Oh, so, uh, sorry, can I, just a supplementary. Uh, is, would this be factored out with a, a service charge? Is, is that how you see this going forward? You guys won't be hands-on as such? Um, at the moment, uh, what the proposal is, is that the, the affordable housing will be operated by Deald Housing Association, uh, who will also manage, manage the whole development going forward. They've got a lot of experience from this type of accommodation. Thank you. Councillor McCall. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you uh, for coming. Um, I just really just to follow on from uh, Councillor Wilson's question regarding the, the traffic comparisons that were for the site, and I just wanted some sort of clarification there. Um, you're, you're saying that the traffic comparisons are done as if the inn was fully open and could be used and utilised as a function room daily at various different times, lunches, dinners, etc. Is that the comparison you're making with the, the roads department? I'm just trying to, to get some understanding and clarity on that. Uh, yes, exactly. I mean, that's the kind of standard approach um, because you, know, you, you have to assess it on the basis of the existing land use. Right. Thank you very much. Any further questions for all? Thank you, gentlemen. That's very kind of you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Right, we'll open up now for questions to officers. Councillor Drysdale. Thank you again, Vice Convener. Yeah, I uh, just had one question, and apologies in advance if I've missed it, but um, uh, we, we saw from the, uh, from the illustrations uh, an adjacent uh, GP surgery. Um, and I also note from, from the papers, uh, or, or rather I do not note any consultation with NHS Tayside in relation to uh, capacity of that surgery to cope with um, the influx of potentially uh, older people. Um, I'm just wondering wh whether NHS Tayside were indeed approached and did not respond. There hasn't been direct consultation with NHS Tayside uh, in terms of the application itself. Notification would have been given directly to the GP surgery being an adjacent property. We haven't had any uh, representation from them in respect of uh, capacity issues. Certainly that's been raised within letters of representation that there is no capacity, but we have confirmed through council officers that they are still taking new patients uh, within Schoon and within the wider area, that surgery and seven others uh, fall within the catchment of this area. 
and I would imagine a lot of those would have capacity. So we haven't had direct comments, but we have considered the issue in the round in terms of capacity generally within the catchment areas of those surgeries. Thank you for that reply. Uh, um, a follow-up, if I may, just quickly. Just uh, Would it be the norm uh, for NHS Tayside to be consulted in relation to something like this? They're consulted within the planning process in terms of the formation of the local development plan. That's where the majority of large-scale developments come through, so they are actively involved in that, and occasionally we would consult them as part of planning applications. On this occasion, um, the consultation wasn't considered necessary for the reasons I've referred to in terms of there being capacity. So yes, they are, they are consulted, uh, they just haven't been for this specific application. Councillor Anderson. Thank you. Um, my question is uh, around about um, if we were minded to grant this, how robust have we got in conditions um, regarding the protection of the owners of these apartments um, when it comes to factoring, uh, considering that uh, there has been in the past situations where factors, and I have one in my constituency who has uh, caused quite a bit of upset by but sort of driving a horse and cart through these conditions, which is co causing a lot of aggravation and, and, and stress to the owners of apartments. Uh, have we, because that was quite a few years ago, so my question is, is the conditions robust enough to ensure that the, the people that own these uh, apartments are protected? As you'll be aware, planning obviously can control and consider the, the use of land and regulation of it. We've had reference earlier that there are planning conditions to control the occupation uh, for the specific needs housing. It wouldn't be planning's role in terms of the actual management of a building and any factoring directly uh, in terms of it might be for how you would manage the landscaping, which there is a condition for in terms of how that would be arranged. But what contract they enter into in terms of buying it or moving into it themselves, but there is obviously other uh, available uh, legislation that they can form residents associations in terms of being able to control who does what within the building that they control. Uh, and we've heard today that it may be Beald who would be managing the property, uh, and that would be, again, something for contractually for the residents to engage with Beald with. Oh, so that's not a planning matter now? Well, the, f the factoring of who maintains a building wouldn't be a planning matter. Uh, that's what I'm clarifying. In terms of the operation, that would be a civil matter between the purchaser and the operator and owner of the building, much like any leasehold property or when you buy a new property, who factors your garden. What I can confirm is in terms of the management of the landscaping and the wider area, we obviously have arrangements in place to make sure things like the surface water drainage uh, is adequate and make sure the landscaping is adequate. So planning crosses over a number of those areas. It's just not the physical, say, repairs and maintenance of the building. Thank you. Councillor Watson. Thank you, Vice Convener. Uh, ju just a, a very quick uh, initial clarification. When did the wheel in cease, cease trading? I believe it was in 2017, and certainly within the viability statement that submitted 2016-17, uh, I think was the last full year of accounts that they've submitted as part of their viability statement. Mm. Mm. Can, I, can I just ask, um, on, on page uh, 37, item 71, where we look at uh, uh, a couple of policies mentioned, one is, is, is C, CF3, um, which, don't mind if I just quickly look it up, which is a uh, development involving the loss or change of use of land or buildings presently used or last used for community purpose will only be permitted where A, B or C type uh, environment. And the other one is RD1, um, where changes away from ancillary uses such as employment land, local shops and community facilities will be resisted unless there is demonstrated market evidence that the existing use is no longer viable. Can I just ask for a bit of expansion just on on um, the, what has been done to uh, meet these criteria uh, to allow for this uh, change of use, especially in line of um, the uh, local development plan with its 29 uh, um, allocating uh, 700 uh, houses for that area of scheme as well. Thank you. 
yes, you've identified they're the two principal policies to establish whether the loss of a community facility and thereafter having a replacement use coming in. So as part of the deliberations for the previous planning application and leading up to the submission of what we have today, they are the key policy considerations to determine we do consider it to be a community facility and thereafter the, the, the loss uh, of that business or actually the site for use of a, a hotel restaurant uh, type facility has been considered. In doing that, the applicant has submitted uh, a number of information in terms of what's available in the locality in terms of uh, other facilities. There are a number of meeting rooms and function facilities still remaining within Schoon. Uh, the Schoon Arms to the, the southern part of the village, which is touched on in the viability statement, has recently opened as a new facility. Uh, and also planning permission. It's not di directly referenced in the viability statement. I think it may have come after, but there is a planning permission in place for the conversion of the former Bank of Scotland building on uh, Perth Road, which is actually almost imminently open, and that's a cafe wine bar. So there are now three public houses within Schoon, or imminently there will be in terms of m meeting that demand. Some provide food uh, in terms of the, their offer as well, which again would offset the loss. Um, so cumulatively, considering the availability of other halls uh, and function facilities and other community facilities, uh, it was demonstrated that the loss of this particular business wouldn't cause an un unacceptable impact on the amenity and the community facilities within Schoon, uh, and that's been considered as part of the proposal. In terms of the viability, they've submitted a statement, uh, as I touched on earlier, in terms of the, the business was operating at a, a loss and an increasing loss on an annual basis. I think it was around about £61,000 was the loss in the last full trading year. Uh, and the assessment undertaken by their charter surveyor suggests that, that lo those losses were only going to increase given the other businesses that are within the area. Uh, in terms of other uses that could be derived from that, that, that business, the viability statement also touched on the, uh, the potential to reconfigure and reprovision the offering within the business. Uh, and it, it did demonstrate that there may be uh, a profit from that but in order to, to tap into the function market. I think the costs for repairing the building and undertaking the internal renovations were something in the order of £525,000. It is accepted that the building has quite a poor fabric condition, so to get up to the standards required, that's been taken into account in terms of the viability of a, another business coming in and using that business. So all told, we do accept that the policy requirements of RD1 and CF3 have been satisfied. Can I just ask for a, just a little bit of clarification again on H20, H29 and the, the LDP on the fact that there, there will be a significant uh, uh, new uh, uh, residences that are set on earmarked in the LDP? Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be directly relevant to consider here, but I know in representation they did make reference that part of the, the offer, if you like, for the number of new houses where the, the, the two businesses or uh, school has in terms of the wheel in, as I've referred to, except in the fact, if it's, this is approved today, that this wouldn't be a business going forward. There is the Schoon Arms, which is now trading, and there is the additional public house coming forward. So again, it's part of the same consideration that's considered that the offer is actually increasing overall, perhaps not in terms of floor space, but there are still a number of other cafes, pubs, restaurants, etc., cetera, uh, and that, that doesn't cause us any concerns. Councillor Drysdale. Thanks, uh, Vice Convener. Just a, a point of clarity. I had understood, and apologies in advance if, again if I'm wrong, but did you say, Mr. Scott, that um, that the wheel in closed for business in 2017? Uh, my understanding was it closed New Year this year. Right. Apologise if that's the case. I, I don't have an exact date, and the report doesn't refer to one. But um, in terms of the viability, it does show the full year accounts, but we wouldn't have, therefore, the partial accounts, I suppose, for the year it was trading in that. Thank you. I think that, that just uh, clarifies. Thank you. But uh, I do believe it was uh, after New Year trading this year. Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Vice Chair. I want to go back to the point um, that I raised with the developers, um, page 28 at the top there, the reduction by four units, and ask the planning service if they consider that that reduction um, was, was sufficient to allow them to go from an unsupportable position to a supportable position, particularly in view of the fact that the height, the height of the blocks appears to me, to, from the limited information I've got available to us, convener, to be approximately the same, um, even although the four-storey blocks have been eliminated. 
Yeah, I can clarify. So we, we did uh, give the feedback that we weren't able to support it by virtue of the size, scale and massing of the building. So in terms of the application we've got in front of us today, it's gone through a pre-application process to revise the design and I'll just touch on a few of the changes. So we're not comparing what we have now to what we have then, but just to clarify what the changes are. Uh, block one for the previous scheme was something in the order of 13.6 metres to the ridge. Um, that ridge, in terms of being a four-storey property, it was actually a mansard roof with quite a, a, an extensive flat section, so it was quite a large block in terms of its mass. So the overall height was 13.6, but it was quite broad and quite mass-like, if you like. What we have now is block one uh, reduced to around about 13 metres and also has a pitch degree, 40 degree roof. So in terms of its height being reduced, but the massing is also reduced in terms of it, there isn't a massing there because it's not a mansard style roof. You've removed a lot of that mass. The previous proposal as well was one contiguous, continuous block uh, in terms of stretching across the centre of the site. Um, as I touched on earlier, what we have now is a block of three storeys, but staggered. So in terms of the massing being broke up pr to provide a visual relief, if you like, in terms of not being seen as one building, but being seen as a, a staggering of two predominantly buildings joining together, but with an elevational change in terms of materials to give it kind of a visual separation. So I'd consider that they, they're the main changes from what we consider to be unacceptable and what we have now. Uh, and the design statement submitted in terms of this application on behalf of the applicant has demonstrated that the reduction, uh, the reduction of mass, the reduction of the size of the building and its response and how it's laid out on site is a far better fit and indeed it would be acceptable whereas the previous scheme was not. Vice Chair, on, on page 40 now, um, residential amenity and noise, whereas 88 and 89 in particular, um, and this is the distance um, a way that some of the, the, the relative window distances are. Um, does the planning service consider that these, which some of them are tighter than others, if I can put it that way, that these distances are acceptable in view of the height and scale and mass of the proposed building? Long, yeah, we do. Um, in terms of block two, um, that's probably more sensitive to how it might interact with existing residents being uh, more closely surrounded by residential properties on Balfourna Road and the, the cul-de-sac on the west there. Uh, the minimum distances from that block to the common boundaries would be 16 metres on its eastern elevation. Um, so even accounting for the fact that it's a two-storey property, it does fully accord with the council's guidelines in, in that respect. And on the western elevation, looking back towards the, uh, the, the properties, they're quite a considerable distance away on the cul-de-sac. So it's 36 metres from the face of the proposed block two to the windows within that property, uh, which is nearest. And again, moving further north within block one, uh, I think it's number 10, you could probably just make out in the, the residential properties on the west of the site there. That's closer, but it still is 28 metres as a window-to-window -window, uh, separation. And on the other side of block one, uh, number 18 Balfourna Road is obviously the closest property in terms of its proximity. And again, the minimum is 16 uh, in that location, but albeit it's offset because of the building stagger. So we have considered it quite thoroughly in terms of how it can fit on the site. And again, the applicant's design statement has, uh, the design's been led by drawing up constraints. So in effect, they, they've, they've drawn a separation distance in terms of meeting the standards for amenity and overlooking, but also to make sure open space has been provided. So in terms of block two, it's one and the same. The, the standoff and the open space provide a degree of separation. And again, planting would come forward in terms of landscaping to provide further mitigation just to make sure there is no adverse impact. I'm grateful for that reply. I've only one more question. Vice Convener, you'll be relieved to know. Um, and that's on page 42, para 99. This is about rainfall events and, and potential. Um, it's really just to check with the planning service. Well, first of all, Para 99 could usefully have a plain English version because I don't know what 6.7 slash S is R. Um, um, I now know because the developer told us, um, but that would be helpful. Um, but are, are we content that given the problems with the barrel drain and Schoon previously, that what is now proposed is, as was outlined by the developer, going to be an improvement or not? We are. We're recommending a planning condition that it doesn't exceed any more than five litres per second. That's in a one in 200 year event. 
uh, at present in a one in two year event, which is obviously a lot more frequent and likely to happen, it's unrestricted and it's 6.7, so there's a substantial increase there. Uh, I can pass on to my colleague, uh, Mr. Bissett, who's here from our flooding section, who can clarify in terms of the proposal and how that would be moved forward. Uh, yeah, just to sort of touch on what Jamie said, existing, uh, the existing situation is there is a connection uh, into the barrel drain. Um, so this surface water from the site is currently draining uh, into the barrel drain. Um, they've provided some high level calculations to identify what rate that currently is. Uh, that's where that 6.7 litres per second is coming from. Um, and as has been mentioned before, there's no suds on site, so that is unrestricted. What the applicant's proposing is to have a full sud scheme in which will provide a restriction on all discharge up to the one in 200 year event, which is a very extreme um, rainfall event um, of five litres per second, um, which will provide betterment on the existing situation. That said, this is um, at high level at the moment. We have requested a condition for the detailed uh, design of the drainage. Um, so if planning is granted, that would have to be satisfied. Um, so there'll be further refinements on that uh, to ensure that there's no increase uh, in terms of water being discharged into the barrel drain compared to the existing situation. Thank you. Councillor Simpson. Thank you, Vice Convener. And with your permission, I have a number of questions, if I may. If I can start off to try again with uh, a couple that I've used already. Can officers give uh, the committee any reason to believe that this proposal is for retirement flats? I can. The applicant has, in their um, application form, applied for the, that specific needs housing. That's the case that they've made, and they've obviously talked about how that's going to be managed and offered to that specific market. To give a surety um, that it meets the definition for, for that market, we're recommending a planning condition to control the occupancy for ages 55 and over. Without that condition and without the nature of the proposal being restricted to that specific needs, it would just be generally regarded as a flag development, which would actually mean that the proposal would be subject potentially to paid developer contributions in terms of education, for instance. So condition two, make sure that the occupation is restricted to that specific age group. Uh, and if it wasn't, we wouldn't be able to support the proposal in its current form. It, it would, uh, developer contributions would come liable. So the two things have been considered, and we are satisfied that we have control over the occupation of the properties. Thank you, Vice well, uh, um, Further to that, and given we've no absolute guarantee, though, uh, I would again question perhaps Rhodes colleagues, with your permission, Vice Convener, uh, to, to reconsider their uh, number of car journeys, because I, I think it seems to be uh, very, very low compared with the possibility, as I say, there's 74 bedrooms in this flat, and I think they, well, I wonder if they've given consideration to the fact that the residents may not be, they may be ancient and over 55, but they may not be retirees and they may drive off to work every day. Mr Lee, would you like to add to that? The vehicle trip generations that have been used, um, the information that's been used, it's, it's actually over and above um, what the reality is in terms of the additional usage of the car park, in terms of the, with the doctor's surgery, etc. So the peak times that we have in our, in our information here, they're actually off peak times compared to the peak times of other um, traffic generated within the area which is generally at 8 to 9 in the mornings and 5 to 6, etc. The peak times that we have um, in these vehicle trip generations from this modelling um, is between 11 and 12 and 1 and 4. And th this, this is based on um, modelling that's, that's used from various, various other sites which are relevant to this particular um, application. I think further to that one, I was looking for a, a plausible answer. I'm not sure I got one, to be honest. I, I, I still go back, and I'm sorry to harp on, but I, I'm, I don't understand how the traffic model is, c we can support a traffic model that doesn't take into consideration the fact that this is a 74-bedroom development, which may or may not 
they may or may not all stay in their beds till half past ten before they go off. But we've, we've no reason to believe, or I have no reason to believe that. And I feel perhaps the traffic model has been, has been uh, perhaps not as robust as it might be. The parking requirements in terms of the development type are dictate the number of parking spaces you require for the development. So as Mr. Lee pointed out there, the particular use of this being restricted within that age profile would typically require a lesser number of car parking spaces and indeed therefore the number of cars coming from the site. So straight away, um, that's quite analogous to the fact when we look at affordable housing that typically the requirements are less. So specific needs housing and within the statement they've submitted, They've used comparable figures in terms of a national kind of average, but also typical uses uh, for other uh, care facilities or age profile facilities. So we accept that the, the car parking standards meet the requirement for this building and therefore the traffic generation from those users of those cars uh, would come out with the AM, PM peaks that we have today. Uh, Mr. Lee had correctly pointed out that typically for general needs housing the peak would be eight to nine for people moving from school runs going to work etc whilst they accept the fact some of the residents here may still be working and may have activities they'd undertake at that time typically the profile is such that the peak is later on in the morning and early in the afternoon therefore an overall lower level of car movements and they don't conflict with the wider am and pm peaks therefore the impact on the wider road network are uh, a lot less so it's actually a double benefit. There's an overall lower number, which we do accept is acceptable, and it's at times when there's likely to be less traffic generally on the road network. A uh, further question, if I may, Mr. <coughs> Convener. Yes. If we move on to paragraph 28, <coughs> which refers to policy PM3, infrastructure contributions, um, I wonder if um, I could get a comment from officers on that one. Um, Given, given what Mr. Scott has just said, if, if there are more residents with cars and there are parking spaces, they'll be parking in the street alongside the doctor's surgery overflow of a local residence and the school drop-off and anyone who happens to be at church. Mr. Scott? I mean, yes, would it so be helpful to read it out, Vice Convener, or we've all got it in front of us, I think. <laughs> Paragraph 28. I think we can all read it. Thanks, Councillor Simpson. Yeah, so that's a relevant um, policy consideration for developer contributions. We've already touched on earlier, given the specific age profile of the, the, the users within the, the facility, um, paragraph 106 onwards within the report gives a more detailed assessment in terms of the, the assessment of that policy and how it relates to this development. So as I've touched on, education contributions would not be required um, given the age profile. Condition 2 restricts the use to ensure that that's, that's the case. Um, paragraph 107 specifically talks about transport implications. So within our adopted uh, supplementary guidance, which uh, provides a practical interpretation of that policy, um, given the reduced uh, number of parking and the reduced number of vehicle movements from the default position for the existing land use proposed, uh, sorry, compared to the proposed, uh, because there's an overall reduction which we accept, there is no contribution required for transport infrastructure. Um, and just whilst we're here in terms of the wider contributions, affordable housing is required, irrespective of the fact of the, the age profile. And as we've heard, the 13 on-site affordable provision has been provided within Block 2. Further quick question, if I may, just on, uh, on uh, the, the vexed question of the, the barrel drain, which is neither a barrel nor a drain, but is a water course, the responsibility of 146 private owners. Um, whilst I recognise that m uh, increased development will reduce the amount going at that point, uh, can I get an assurance from flooding colleagues that the downstream uh, part of, the, of this uh, water course will take the water coming from the upstream? There is a history of flooding at the Bleachy to the north of this site, a history of flooding of the uh, doctor's surgery, a history of flooding on the road, the Stormont Road, and I would like some assurance, if possible, that um, given that I accept that there will be less coming from this site, have we any reason to believe the water coming from the north will still be able to exit at the south? Mr. Bishop, would you like to comment? Um, so, just to sort of clarify, your, your query is in relation to the, the open section of the drain just upstream across the road from the doctor's surgery. Just but just to be absolutely clear, I recognise that the development will not put any more water in, but yep. my concern is will the downstream part 
that goes underneath the whole of schooner comes out underneath the, the, the schoon arms, will that still accept all the water coming from the north of this site? Do we have any reason to believe that? Or will the flooding of the pass continue in Stormont Road at the doctor's surgery and at the bleaching? I don't expect to have a crystal ball. I just wonder if we have uh, any idea of I the flow. I don't think the, the query is really relevant to this development. However, I can try and answer it for you. Um, they did carry out a flood risk assessment, um, which obviously identified that there is a constriction at that point. So there will be overland flow issues still coming over that point, um, which has been identified on the site um, as areas to avoid development and things, and it basically follows the line of the barrel drain. Um, so there will still be overland flow issues um, coming across and through the Wheeland site, uh, as is the existing situation. So the development has to provide a, a neutral effect on flood risk at worst, and it's demonstrating that at this point. One final one, I promised, Vice Convener, and this relates to the, the reduction in the scale and mass. G given that we are lay people on this committee, can uh, officers give us an idea of a percentage reduction in the scale and mass? Because looking at the plans and the photo montages, I personally find it difficult to, to see it. I don't have a, a calculation in terms of the volume of the previous buildings with what we have now, but given the overall reduction in height and massing of particularly the upper floor, so we're moving from a mansard to a 40 degree, without trying, I wouldn't want to try and visualise what that is, but you, you remove a substantial amount of mass in that, and that's obviously where it's at its most perceived from a wider viewpoints in terms of it being higher, so that's where the, the greatest benefit. And again, the staggering of the building and materials to a, a lesser extent all these things have to be considered cumulatively in terms of design, so it's not simply about the height uh, and the mass, it's also about how it's laid out and how it appears on the site. Um, so no, I don't have a calculation, but we are satisfied, having considered the design statement submitted by the applicant, that that is a, uh, sorry, a suitable response to design for this site. Do we have any further questions? Then we'll move on to <coughs> the debate part. Any comments from members, first of all, may I ask? Simpson. Just a very brief one. I'm sorry to harp on our broken record about the car parking situation, but um, given I, I'm, I'm advised that it uh, is not competent to, to uh, make it a condition of this particular planning application, can I ask if the council has any responsibility for um, the, the loss of this well-used piece of infrastructure, which uh, is going to cause is going to cause some difficulties within the area. I'm sorry, Council, we're in debate. We're in debate. Oh, sorry, I, I would. I would. I, I am I, so can I rephrase it then? I am unconvinced that there's anything that's going to help with the traffic problems that are going to re, uh, arise immediately. The Harris fencing goes up. There is going to be traffic problems in school. And Council McCall. Thank you, Acting Convener. Um, Again, just, just following on from that particular point in the debate, um, when we look at traffic, um, I know we're dealing with hypotheticals to, to a slight degree here, but if, we, if the inn was fully functioning and the inn was open, there would be an increased amount of traffic following that road um, on a regular basis with no control over how many uh, times or the times of day that uh, anybody was coming and going from the inn. Um, the, the movement forward um, takes us to a position where we can analyse the traffic movements and we can actually base this uh, on the development that's in front of us. Um, so uh, as much as I understand the points being made um, regarding traffic, I think the situation is, uh, is, is moving on from where it was. If we had a, a look at the, the basis that we were back at the beginning where the two comparisons are made between the inn as a fully functioning inn and where we are looking at the application in front of us, then we're actually in a position where we can look at and dictate a little bit to the, the traffic movements that are going through school. Can we have a motion? a motion, uh, Vice Chair, if I may, I, I would move refusal of this planning application. Um, I am uh, unconvinced that the, the height, uh, the massing, the scale or the density is appropriate to this site. I, I am unconvinced by the answers I have received. Uh, bear in mind if I, uh, if I, if I, if I, that the, the present height of most of the site is zero, so what we're getting is going to be 14 metres higher than that. 
I have a number of uh, drawings uh, to hand, um, which I've not distributed, but for my information, and as a lay person, I see virtually no difference between the, the original application and this one. So on the basis of the four things I mentioned there, particularly with regard to, to PM1A and B, Part C, and RD1, I move refusal of this application. Before we go any further, could I ask, do we have a seconder? The amendment, Councillor Wilson, thank you. Would you like to make a comment? Yes, indeed, I'll, I'll formally um, second the, the motion for refusal. Um, I'm quite amazed, Vice Convener, that this token reduction in the number of units and small changes, in my opinion, to the scale and massing of the buildings um, is acceptable in any way. I understand, Vice Convener, that it may be possible to propose a residential development for this site, um, but I think this is the wrong solution um, in, in the wrong manner, in, in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, the, there is an issue about the overall height, um, which I, I don't see as a, a major reduction. I made the point that there were no other three-storey buildings in the immediate vicinity, and there are not. There are some buildings that are, in elevational terms, higher up than the proposals, but they're not in the immediate vicinity. Um, and I think that the amenity of some of the existing dwelling houses will be diminished by, um, se seriously diminished by the height and scale and massing of these, these proposals. Um, I, I think there are also issues that are a bit intractable about car parking, but I think with a, a degree of goodwill and a bit more innovation um, and thought, then the proposals could have come up with this par car parking proposal that may have been more available for community use at various times that wouldn't necessarily have clashed with the day-to-day -day usage that the, the, the residents. And one of the big issues in that is if the number of units was a good deal smaller, then that would allow for a much more flexible approach to car parking. For these reasons, I'm happy to second the motion for refusal. Thank you, Councillor. Do we have an amendment? Thank you, Vice Convener. Yeah, um, I, I hear the arguments um, uh, against the proposal. However, I, w I, I want to recommend uh, approval uh, on the basis outlined in the report. Um, what we have at the moment is a, uh, a closed down uh, restaurant facility, uh, which um, it, it is proposed to be replaced by uh, accommodation for which there is significant and growing demand uh, in Perth and Kinross uh, and this is a, a, a relatively open site with um, adequate space for parking etc that uh, that needs to go with it uh, so on balance I am um, um, prepared to recommend approval uh, as presented Do we have a second yep. to <laughs> Councillor Gray yeah uh, thank you Convener. Um, I'm happy to uh, second that uh, amendment. Uh, the debate over the mansard roof as opposed to a slope roof, I think it's, it's clear to say if you put the two together, you would see uh, right away that the mansard roof is an increased massing effect. It may not be a specific uh, or a distinctive amount of uh, increased massing, but the effect is of an increased massing. Um, and that's, that can be appreciated by anybody who looks at both of them. The parking thing, I think, is a non-event. I mean, whether, whether it is, uh, is useful for other purposes, that piece of ground isn't significant to this. The owner of the, 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 the property is quite entitled to actually develop as he sees fit with the appropriate parking. This is exactly what's happening. I'm perfectly happy to uh, second the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. I'll pass this over now to Mr. Elliott. Thank you, Vice Convener. Uh, what I want to do is clarify the full terms of the motion to refuse. I do have one query in, in one respect, um, but I'm going to go slowly through it as to what I think you've um, narrated in terms of the motion to refuse. But I think you've said the proposal is contrary to policies PM1A and PM1B subdivision C and RD1 of the, it's a Perth and Kinross Local Development Plan 2014, and it's um, on the basis, and I want to clarify, uh, from what I heard, you're actually referring to
to the, the scale mass and the block, the, the main block. Is that correct? Well, you're talking the whole proposal, um, you've been concentrating on the height in terms of the three storeys. That would only be the, the main block, not the other block. I think the main block. Yes. Yes. Uh, on the basis of the, I think you said the massing, height, and scale. Now, this is, I want to pause as well. You also talked about the density. Now, the density. I think I think I'd still like to keep the density in, if I may. Sorry? I still we still want to keep the density in. in. Uh, but I think you have to explain why um, the, it's an over it's a overdevelopment of the site. The, the density is not not covered by PM one. Uh, it is yes, but I think the issue there is at the moment you refer to the massing <coughs> excuse me, height and scale of the main block, but then you've also referred to density. And at the moment, I'm unclear as to why this would affect, this is um, over density in terms of the actual site. The proposal would be over density because you do have, as I understand it, meeting the standard in terms of amenity for the site. I think given, given that point, Mr. Wright, we'll withdraw the density yeah, aspect. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Um, so go, the proposal is contrary to policies PM1A and PM1BC and RD1 and local Perth and Ross Local Development Plans 2014 on the basis of the massing height and scale of the main block, um, not, and this is reference to the policy term, not contributing to nor respecting the character of the media area, which is what Councillor refer Wilson referred to. Now that's my understanding as to what the motion is. Once clear, Councillors Simpson and Wilson, is that the terms of the motion to refuse? Yep. Okay. So, uh, Vice Commissioner, what we have is a motion by Councillor yep. Simpson and Wilson to refuse on the terms I've just outlined, and amendment by Councillors Drysdale and Gray to grant in line with the report. Councillor Simpson, would you like to sum up? No, I think I've said enough, uh, Vice Chair. <laughs> okay, I'll hand over to Mr. Williams now to conduct the vote. Yes, good morning, members. Uh, in accordance with Standing Order 58, the Council's Standing Orders, we will now go to a roll call vote. If, when I call your name, you can inform me whether you'll be voting for the motion proposed by Councillor Simpson and seconded by Councillor Wilson, or the amendment proposed by Councillor Drysdale and seconded by Councillor Gray, both which have been summed up by uh, Mr. Elliott. Councillor Anderson. Amendment. Councillor Band. Amendment. Councillor Brown. Amendment. Councillor Drysdale. Amendment. Councillor Gray. Amendment. Councillor Illenworth. Amendment. Council Jarvis. Amendment. Council McCall. Amendment. Council Simpson. Council Waters. Amendment. And Council Wilson. Motion. Members, that's two in favour of the motion to refuse, nine in favour of the, mo the amendment to grant, therefore the amendment carries. Thank you, members. Applications approved. We'll now move on to the next papers. As you will have read, we have uh, two applications on the same site 
Mr. R, Mr. Howie. Um, I propose, as we have done in the past, to hear both together, uh, deputations and reports from officers and questions. Once we get to the debate stage, we'll part the papers back again and deal with them separately from there on. So I'm going to ask Mrs. Conley to introduce the papers. Thank you, Vice Convener. Um, as the Vice Convener has just said, we're going to look at the two applications under the one presentation here. This first slide shows both sites. So the first application on your agenda is the one that is in yellow, so that's the position of the one shed, and then the application um, in red is the second application, which is actually two buildings um, for the hay shed. This shows it a little clearer and also shows the previous application which was granted planning consent back in 2015. Um, so the yellow one is the new store for agricultural storage and it sits next to another building which already has planning permission for um, agricultural storage. The middle, the long building in the middle has consent for um, the cattle building and then, <coughs> excuse me, um, the red is the second application and that's for hay storage and that sits adjacent. The one it's adjoined to is also has permission for hay storage and then the last building to the left there um, is actually for feeder, um, feed mix and fodder. This um, first shot is taken from the B924 and we're looking across towards Newton of Pitcairn which are the buildings that you see. The site is actually really in the middle of the picture there. Um, the light color that is the um, plastic around the hay that is on the site is just a, a clue because you'll see that in a couple of pictures. And the site sits just beyond that um, and before the trees that you see which bound the, the site. This is up at the junction with the B934, which is the Yetz of Market Road. Um, and this, up, this access was granted consent back in 2012 and it leads down to the site. Um, so the council car that you see is on the actual access in towards the site. This is just a little bit further down. So the area that is um, scraped across that you can see at the moment is actually the application site. And just to the right of the screen, you can see um, the bound hay that I commented on at the start, which just gives an idea of where the site is. <coughs> this is the entrance into the site, just following down that um, access road that you saw. In the distance there, you can see the buildings of Newton of Pitcairn, um, and you can also see the trees that bound the site and the burn that runs. Well, you can't see the burn, but the burn is just beyond the trees there um, on that part of the site. And this shows just the final part of the application site. So all of the area that is scraped down there um, shows the site that got consent previously in 2015 plus the proposed site for the two applications which are before you today. And this just takes us back to the layout so that you can see where both applications sit. Thank you, Vice Convener. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I have Mr. Howie here um, today. He hasn't any comments to make, but he's prepared to come forward and answer any questions from the committee. So. Could I ask, do we have any questions for Mr. Harry at all before I call him forward? No questions? Okay, no. Mr. Harry, if you would come forward, please. <laughs> Tried to get you out of it. <laughs> Councillor Gray. Yeah, will there be any specific processes taking place within either of these buildings? No, they will be purely for general plan storage. Thank you. Any other questions before I? No. Thank you, Mr. Howie. That was quick and simple. Thank you. Thank you. So we go to questions for officers. Any questions for officers, please? No? Okay. We'll move to debate. So we'll now separate the papers back out again. So we're now looking at the erection of an uh, agricultural building round southeast of AM Howie Yard, Yetz Road, Dunning. Do we have any comments, please? Councillor Gray. Can we approve the papers? Do we have a seconder for that? I'll second it. Okay. Any I'm amendments? No. Can we pass the paper then? Approved. Right. 
And we'll move on to the second part of this, which is the erection of two agriculture storage buildings, same area. Um, are we, can I get a motion from you, Mr. Council Gray again? Yeah. Through the paper, seconder? Seconded. Any amendments? No? Then the paper's passed. That was a nice quick one. Thank you. We now move on to the next. Could I just check if there's anybody else who wants to come in? If we have space, no. Right, members, we'll move on to the next uh, paper, which is the erection of a free-range egg production unit and associated works uh, 800 metres southwest of East Ardler Farm. That's Main Street, Ardler. And could I ask Mrs Condiff again to introduce the paper? Thank you, Vice Convener. Uh, this first layout is in two parts. To the left of the screen, you can see in red, which is the application site, um, and it shows the village of Ardler to the northeast of the site. To the right of the screen is the proposed layout, uh, which is a, a large agricultural building which would house the um, birds and the access parking um, area, which is just to the south of that. You can see just beyond the red line site a line of trees. That's an existing tree belt, and you'll see that in the um, forthcoming slides, but it is all within the ownership of the applicant. This is at the junction with the, um, the Keeler Road. The Keeler Road that, you that goes to the left of the screen is the access down towards the um, site. The other road is the Kettens across to Ardler Road, which is more of a main road, with the Keeler Road uh, secondary road leading down to the application site. This is from the south of the site, and that's showing the um, tree line, the shelter belt that I referred to in the first slide. So the proposal is actually on the other side, it's to the north of those trees, but this was just to show the proposed site from the south. So as I say, the site is beyond the line of trees that you see on this shot. This is the um, proposed site. So you can get your bearings from the shelter belt that you see to the right of the screen and um, further in. Um, that is obviously to the south, the tree belt, and then again um, further to the, to the east. Um, if you look just on the left-hand side of the screen, the light buildings that you can see in the distance, that's um, the village of Ardler. And this is taken more or less from the same point, but just looking around a little further, just to get your bearings, you can just see the, um, the spire of the church of Ardler. So it gives you an indication as to the proposed site and where it is in relation to um, the village of Ardler. And this is the access, there's existing field access into the site. The proposal will remove part of this wall to ensure visibility um, and the access will then go from there into the proposed development site. And back to the layout, it's again showing both um, the relationship to Ardler and the proposed development. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have some deputations on this. Could I first call up uh, Mr. Mulholland and Mr. Ellis, who are both objectors to the proposal. Welcome back, Mr. Ellis. As usual, you have five minutes between you, and there will be a one-minute warning when you're at the four-minute stage. Councillors, I speak on behalf of the many Adler residents who are opposed to this planning application. Adler is a historically planned rural village in the middle of prime agricultural land in Strathmore and home to around 200 residents and is a haven for walkers and cyclists. At the outset, I should say that no one has any objection to Mr and Mrs Gruer wanting to diversify their farming business, but we believe that the plans for a 32,000 chicken development so close to the village contravenes the local development plan in many ways. Policy 1A. We believe this industrial development will be hugely detrimental to the natural environment and brings no quality to the locally built environment. It will have an adverse effect 
on the, uh, an adverse impact on the character of the area and further increase the footprint of this business in relation to the village. Policy 8G, traffic issues are already a major source of concern for local people. We have accepted the expansion of Gruer Farms Limited over the last 20 years and have been very tolerant of the extensive HGV and tractor traffic going through the centre of the village. But any additional traffic will not only lead to further degradation of the roads and verges, but it will also impact on the safety of the many walkers and cyclists on what are supposed to be walker and cycle friendly roads with a 40 mile an hour speed limit at which the council set its store in during an extensive consultation exercise many years ago at great expense. These narrow country roads which the council has to maintain will not support the heavy traffic generated by this proposed development. In fact, the Keeler Road which leads to the site is not even wide enough for two cars to pass and has no passing place apart from access to a field. Policy 48, the land in question is prime agricultural land as it states in the report and we believe this is an inappropriate use of this land. Another key issue is the potential pollution from the effluent this development will generate. This will have a detrimental impact on the watercourse network which eventually feeds into the River Isla with a consequent effect on local wildlife which includes lapwings, owls, skylarks, red squirrels and also otters have been cited. Some of these are abundant in the surrounding area including the woods at the back of the unit. In the report in paragraphs 59 and 60, it talks about the development requires to be in an isolated location. The shed will be 454 metres from Birch House and 516 metres to the village. We have since found out from a new application map, uh, which we received this one, that the range uh, of, the, of the envelope um, is larger than the initial application. The distance from the new boundary fence to Birch House is 165 metres and 232 metres to the nearest house in the village. Also, the new boundary fence sits on the edge of a waterway that feeds into Meagle Burn. There is no precedent anywhere else in rural Perthshire for such a development to be placed so close to a community and the potential consequences of noise, noise increased vermin and odour in such close proximity to the village are serious. The strength of the feeling is demonstrated by the high number of objections lodged and the ongoing expressions of concern indicates that there is no support for, from the village for a development which will change the local environment for the worse and as such we strongly object to this development for the reasons I have stated. Uh, good morning. You have one minute left. Uh, okay, I'd like to refer to the mental health and well-being um, Bertrand and Ross action plan, which states that uh, as a strategy to shift resources to prevent harm. I'm asking you to do this because right now I feel extremely exposed and vulnerable and I know that will be the case long after I leave this building. But I also represent several other villagers suffering similar turmoil. I'm being treated for depression and to cope with just the thought of this application being granted have had my medication quadrupled. I am now on the maximum advisable dose, yet still struggle with this spectre every day. My home environment is a major part of my treatment. It's my safe place. Working in my garden has always helped me to rest the chaos in my mind. My doctor has also endorsed this as an invaluable therapy. Gentlemen, that's five minutes. <laughs> so I can't finish. Your five minutes is up, so that's, that's it, I'm afraid. But if you can stay there for questions before you go, uh, and if before asked, councillors, if I can ask a couple of questions, please. Uh, the first one is actually to Mr Ellis, uh, and, and the second one perhaps to both of you. Um, the first one relates to the chicken farm, the odour. Uh, Mr. Ellis, you've obviously been a councillor. You know the Bridge of Cali area, which I now represent. Um, there is a chicken farm, as you know, adjacent to the caravan site, which is, is between my own property and the chicken farm. We never really, I've never experienced any problems with odour or any problems of noise, uh, and I don't think any of the caravanners have. I just wondered if you wanted to comment on that. 
I do appreciate it's not an egg, egg, chickens, egg, an egg production plant, it's for chickens for food, but nonetheless it is there, and I just wonder if you wanted to comment on that. Um, all I would say, uh, Councillor Braun, is the fact that um, we're here today discussing the, the unit at Adler, not Bridget Cali, um, and I don't want to comment any further on that. Um, it is next to the Catron Trail, um, and I haven't had any objections or any adverse comments like that, but this is a totally different scenario um, to the one in Bridget Cali. Thank you. And the other question I would ask both of you, Alder is a village surrounded by agricultural land. Yeah. Living in the countryside, you would expect, I would think, to hear uh, animal noises, cattle, sheep, pigs, chickens. Uh, that's just part of living in the countryside, surely. I'm sorry, well, I'm asking a question to the <coughs> deputation, not to the public. Thank you. Yeah, I agree that we uh, should expect to experience farming, sea farming, and I don't see this as farming. From my garden, I look right out on this site. This is a 175 meter long metal shed, 6.2 meters high, 16 meters, I think, in depth. And it will be surrounded with metal electrified fencing. In my mind, that's an industrial estate. That does nothing for the visual amenity of the village. And it certainly does nothing for my health. The fact that I will have to look at that every day, breathe in any detritus from it, because the prevailing wind blows right across the village. I just cannot countenance this, this building. I can't countenance a life Thank with you, this Mr. building and this plant in it. Thank you, Mr. Mahon. I'm going to open this up to councillors now. Councillor Gray. Yeah, thank you. Um, Councillor Ellis. Oh, sorry, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Ellis. <laughs> no, wait. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Bob. Um, could you explain the, the change from 550 and 500 something or other, 454 and 500 metres from the building, and where does 165 and 232 metres come in? Is well, this part of the grazing area? As I said, um, and when I was speaking, um, we had these ones, these maps here sent to us, um, but also through um, the um, internet, I received or, or we received in the village this one. Now, this one depicts the actual range area that those hens are going to be allowed to walk about, congregate, scrabble, what have you. The range of, the, of, of that area, the nearest point to the first house, which is Birch House, is 165 metres. So uh, what we're talking about here is the, the range, the, the, the freedom from where the hens are, not the actual building, but where those hens are going to be and it's uh, 232 metres to the nearest house in the village, which is Mr Mulholland's. And also the boundary um, of that is right on one of the existing waterways. Thank you, Mr Ellis. I did ask, was this the grazing area? This what, it, it is, is the, the grazing, grazing area. area that we're yeah. talking about, yeah. Do you therefore see any, what difference is it going to be when it's grazing cattle, which I believe it was did, that field, uh, or grazing chickens. Uh, it's farm life. Um. I think, as, as my colleague has said, we live in the country. Adler is a really beautiful village. Um, but we have done a lot of investigation in this, Councillor Gray, and we are very much aware that there are predominant smells, odours coming from free-range chickens and to, to have the prevailing wind, which comes at all times from the west, um, those odours are going to be consistent um, throughout the village. Can I have a supplementary on the odour issue? Um, in, the in the papers here, it did state that the, the manure would be removed regularly and uh, 
that would eventually be spread on the fields around the farm. I have some experience of odours from farmyard manure, including chicken manure, and I can assure you the odour coming from that field spread right up to the edge of the village will be an awful lot worse than it will be from... <laughs> Do we have a question? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Do you appreciate that point? As I said before, um, we do live in, in um, a rural area surrounded by prime agricultural land. Um, but as I say, we have, ta we have investigated this seriously um, on behalf of the, the 200 residents in the village. And no matter who I have spoken to and other people have spoken to, we have been told that there will be and a strong odour, whether it's coming from the hens or coming from the manure, but there will be a strong odour coming in that vicinity. Councillor Drysdale. Thank, thank you, convener. I had um, two questions, uh, if I may. Um, uh, the first of all, uh, just, just to be absolutely clear in my mind, um, gentlemen, um, uh, on the, the noise and odour issue, uh, you're not living in a different country. Can you just confirm that, that the prevailing wind is southwesterly and that um, if this um, uh, plant was, were to go ahead, uh, the wind would be taking any noise and um, odour that may exist uh, directly towards your village? I have only lived in the village of Adler for one and a half years. And in that space of time, the wind has always come from the southwest, and talking to the other residents in the area, they have also um, said that. Thank you. And my second question, if I may, which is in relation to the um, number of um, uh, comments that have been received here. Um, are you aware, gentlemen, of, of uh, any uh, residents for whom I presume you, you represent the village, are you aware of any residents uh, who are in favour of this development? Yes, two. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. Of which we, of which we know about. Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Vice Good morning to both of you. Um, a question for Mr Mulholland, first of all. Sir, where, where is your home in relation to the proposed site. I'm, I'm on page 117 of the, the volume, but I'm just wondering where, where your home is in relation to the proposed site. Um, <coughs> my home sits um, in the corner of the village. So, so you're in, in the village envelope? I'm in, I'm in the village, yeah. I'm right in the corner. Um, from my front door, um, I just have to look that way and I'm looking directly at the site. That's all I have to move my head. Okay. And just a supplementary on that, if I may, um, on, on the plan I've got at East, Ar East Ardler, is that the farm buildings, the concentration of farm buildings for this patates and other products? Yes. Yeah. So, yes, those are uh, other buildings. Um, you know, of a similar design, I believe, to, to what's proposed. So then we would be sandwiched between two, what I like to call, industrial estates. Okay. Um, my next question is for Mr. Ellis. Um, and that you mentioned, sir, that the, there was, it was near the burn. I'm trying to find out which burn this is that leads into the Meagle burn. Is that the Keeler burn or is that it's a different burn? Yeah, there's a, there's a whole series of watercourses all yep. around that area and the majority of them eventually feed into the, the Meagle burn, which runs the village, um, and in turn the Meagle burn will feed uh, um, eventually into the River Isla. Thank you. Councillor Anderson. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, Mr. Ellis, um, I'm a bit confused about this. Uh, and you alluded to it in one of the, the, the <coughs> um, one of the questions you asked, uh, and it says here one of the objections: it's impact on chickens being outdoors. Can you explain to me 
how have the, how do you find, or how does the, the complainants find it being so objectionable to chickens being outdoor and free range? Sorry, could you repeat? Your can, can you explain to me why you or whether it's other objectors, explain to me how you find it so objectionable for chickens to be outdoors in a field? It's the close proximity to the village and to the near houses. That is what we are objecting to. I would say that we are not objecting at all to the diversification of um, Brewer Farms Limited. Um, and it's just the fact that it's, that it's far too close for this to the village and we just don't want it. If it goes elsewhere, fine, we don't have a problem with that. But this close to the village with the noise, the odours, the effect it could have on um, wildlife, as I've explained before, um, we just don't think it's appropriate for this site. Uh, can I have a, another question on a, a diff different issue? Uh, increase in traffic, will all the traffic that's uh, going to be uh, emanating from this uh, project be going through the village? There is historically an informal one-way system which was put into place by Mr. Grewer Sr. some years ago where when um, he was looking at his potato plant um, that it was going to come down the washy bray from the A94. It goes right into the centre of the village and it turns right immediately in front of the Ardblair, sorry, the Adler Tavern turns right and goes along to the potato farm. To get to the Keeler site, um, it would continue through the village, a tight left-hand turn followed by a tight right-hand turn, and then it would go along there until it went left into the Keeler Road and up to the site. The Keeler Road is not wide enough for two cars, two ordinary cars to pass by. There are no passing places whatsoever um, the, the, if you want to call them passing places, fine, but all they are is muddy entrances into a field, which if it's rained, snowed, what have you, I certainly wouldn't take my car in there uh, because the chances are it would get stuck. Uh, but as I say, that road, Keeler Road, which is a, a 40 mile an hour road for safety walking and cycling, there is absolutely no way at all that a car and a lorry would be able to pass each other without one of them going into one of the ditches on the soft verges at the side of those roads. It's just, it's, it's totally not safe and I'm quite surprised that roads have not made um, any comment on that at all. Thank you. Councillor McCall. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ellis, can I just follow on from that, if that's okay? Um, am I right in thinking this is a, a, a public highway? You're, you're raising issues here about the, the width of it, etc. but it is a public highway. It we could have lorries going up and down it without any problem at the moment. Yes, you, yeah, yes, you could. could do, Councillor. Okay, that's lovely. Thank you. Do we have any further questions? <laughs> Thank you for coming forward. I'd now like to ask Mr. Sharp to come forward. He is um, uh, sh appearing on behalf of the applicant. Good morning, Mr. Sharp. Again, you have five minutes to speak, and there'll be a one-minute warning when you get close to the end. Thank you, Vice Convener. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. <coughs> My name is Malcolm Sharp, an environmental scientist with Scotland Rural College. I'm also an environmental advisor to the British Egg Industry Council. Uh, with me today, I've got Lucy and Peter Grewer from Farm at East Ardler. The development proposed <coughs> is a very modern building which operates to the very highest levels and the best available techniques that are available. We have a lot of experience of this type of development, particularly in terms of assessing environmental impacts from it. And we know that a modern unit of the design proposed actually has a very low impact. It is perhaps unfortunate that 
quite often happens in planning situations that we're particularly with poultry developments that the public are misled and alarmed by such developments. In this case, this proposed shed for free range laying hens, it's located over half a kilometer from the, from the village and the, the nearby the housing. Um, now, I can say with a great deal, deal of confidence, having done a lot of assessments on these buildings, and hopefully in some way to reassure the public that they will not suffer adverse impacts from such building. Air quality is often cited as one of the issues when doing polluted developments, particularly things like it's already been mentioned, odours and particulates. Um, but I can assure people that even we have done assessments on these type of buildings and even standing relatively close to the building, by close I mean you know, within 50 metres of the building, you should not be smelling odours from the building. One of the reasons for this, one of the main reasons of course, is the manure handling system that the building does not contain manure. It's removed regularly. By regularly, I mean twice a week. So it's a very different prospect from poultry buildings of maybe 20, 30 years ago. It simply will not emit a lot of odours. Um, in terms of the, of the, the, the planning, the, the traffic, um, that, that was raised as an issue there. Bear in mind that the, the traffic developments to this are the order of a very few vehicles per week, not per hour, not per day, but a very few vehicles per week. And, and the route that was discussed there, um, that's not an informal route. That is what was, I believe, the subject uh, of a 1996 planning condition. And I think that's actually referred to in, in the, in the council report there and that's been adhered to by the applicants for, for many years now and um, the report is suggesting that, that that continues but the point I'd like to make is that traffic movements are very very low and the order it is literally the order of a very few vehicles per week. I do understand there's been some concern about the grazing in the field I, that, that now I I'd like to point out that that's probably beyond this planning development it's, it's grazing animals beyond the red line boundary of this development. But I can give some to reassurance people, hopefully if they are concerned. Research has shown generally that at any one time, around about 20% of birds are out in the field. They tend to stay fairly close to the shed. Good grazing management will encourage them to go further and that's a good thing. In my view, there's no more benign and pastoral situation than a few birds grazing and exhibiting natural behaviour in a grass field. If you were in a house at Ardler, um, if you looked over the hedge, you might see them. You may need binoculars, but it, it literally is a few poultry in a field. The concentration of birds is in the building, and the building is designed such that, that the, the emissions of odours and particulates most certainly... You have one minute have remaining. Will, ...will not have any adverse effect um, on a village that's it's half a kilometre away. We're very grateful to the committee for the, uh, the, for the comprehensive council report recommending approval. Um, it also recommends a number of quite rigorous conditions which the applica applicants are very happy to comply with and continue with good community engagement as part of that process. Thank you, Mr. Vice Convener. Thank you. If you could just stay there for a moment, I'll ask if there are any questions. There's going to be a few. We'll go from the left. Councillor Inglis first. Thank you. Um, you mentioned number of vehicles per week. Can you give me a, a harder figure than just very few, please? Pardon, I've got the microphone on. Um, the supporting information, egg collection, three or four collections per week. Um, I would imagine three there would be plenty. It would depend on the size of the vehicle. Feed deliveries would be approximately, for that number of birds, one lorry per week, and that would be an HGV lorry delivering feed. Um, manure re removal, um, either one lorry road or two farm trailer roads per week. So three, four, five, six, six, seven, eight vehicles per week, no more than that. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Vice Convener. Um, on the map that we see on the left-hand side of the screen here, um, that shows the building, the red outline. What, what, is the, what I'm not quite clear about, Vice Convener, is the extent of the grazing area in relation to that. Because you 
had a representation about the grazing area being near near the village. Could you tell us what, what the grazing area is? Yes, I can. Um, the, the, the free range areas are strictly controlled by welfare legislation. Um, birds can graze up to, I think it's 150 metres from a building, and that can be extended if we, there are certain enhancements in the grazing area. That can be extended up to 300, a maximum of 350 metres from the building. So on, on the plan that we see there, where does 300 metres come to? There is, uh, it's not on that screen, I don't know if it's I that. I can, yeah, come in, I can come in there if you like. Um, mm -hmm. So at the um, corner here, uh, I can, you maybe can't quite see it, but the, the top corner of the, the red line there, um, yeah. is the building is 575 metres from the corner of the village, so 350 feet is just over halfway to the village. Um, and on that, in terms of um, maps and things that were referred to um, by the objectors, um, we first discussed this over a year ago in a, in a, um, in a, in a, in a forum um, where I sat down with um, the objector group and, and we discussed the field range and the fencing and all that was discussed more than a year ago. Um, it doesn't form part of this planning application um, because it's agricultural grazing and agricultural fencing in agricultural farmland, um, basically. So it's that part of it, but it's still a considerable distance away from the village, um, bearing in mind that the maximum allowed um, is 300, it's an absolute maximum of 350 metres away from the both the building and which they're housed um, by regulation. This might seem a strange question, but I grew up with hens away back in the, the old days and they used to make quite a lot of what I would clucking noises. Um, <laughs> if there's 32,000 of them, that could be quite a lot of and I know there's not going to be any cockerels, so it says that in the application. That's right. Um, so uh, do, do they make a lot of noise? Do they make any noise at all? You would have to be very close to the shed to hear them. If you walk by the shed, they are very curious, and you would hear them then. <coughs> Excuse me, you would not hear them inside the building. If you were outside the building close to the shed, you would hear, yeah, as you described, exactly gentle clucking noises. Okay. Um, final point, uh, Vice Convener. There was some reference to other sites uh, earlier on. Is, is there another site in Perth and Kinross where there's a similar facility that you could point us towards and saying there's, there's, not, been, there's not been the yes, fears there, that the local, several, local several, folk have got? Um, are one very recent one um, at um, <coughs> Abernethy, um, Mr. Wilson, um, and that's been through Perth and Kinross planning. Um, we took um, local residents, interested local residents, on a bus tour um, last April um, around three local sites. One was in, in Perth and Kinross um, up at Colcock Farm at Ailith. Um, the other two were actually in Angus, um, but very similar sites. One, one within 450 <coughs> metres from Forfar, from buildings in Forfar. Um, the other one is at Lundy Castle Farms, which actually has double the number. 64,000 um, hens. It's at it's at like it's at Piper Dam, um, within about six or seven hundred metres of the housing at um, Piper Dam. And all local, all interested local residents, um, which came to ten in number, um, came round on that uh, eight on that bus tour. Sorry, and two were were accommodated by separate um, visits due to them not being available that day. But there are <coughs> um, plenty. These are just three. Um, or four that were at, um, I can rattle off the top of my head. Um, there will be others, um, and there, there, there are others um, in, in the area. They're quite commonplace. Councillor Drysdale. Thank you, Vice Convener. Uh, good morning, or is it good? Uh, it's still good morning. Um, I wonder if we could possibly get the, uh, the Ordnance Survey map back up on, on screen, if that's possible, uh, as in this, this map, is that? We don't have it. Okay, um, I'll just have to go with what I have in front of me then. Um, so I'm looking at the Ordnance Survey map that, that shows the proposed site uh, and the village of Ardler um, uh, to the northeast thereof. Can you perhaps explain or, or c can you clarify for me uh, the full extent of land owned by yourselves? Uh, 
in relation to this site, i.e., uh, you know, does it extend mu for much of this ordnance survey map, or, or where, where, where are the bounds? Um, I don't have visuals of the map in front of you, but I, I, I can tell you that the family um, own we own 1,100 acres of land around Ardler. Um, we've had this discussion um, at great lengths <coughs> with the people of Ardler. Um, and in within the first sit down with them, which was last February, the discussion about potential other sites came up. Um, and I said, right from the outset, I'm very happy to look at whatever other sites anybody would wish to propose. And the three of the delegation um, from Ardler, um, of which Mr. Ellis was one, along with two other Ardler residents who are not present um, today, Mr. Dingwall and um, Mrs. Brereton, um, were also in that delegation. Um, and I gave them my farm maps at that point. Obviously, we have looked at our farm map of our land ownership, and we have selected what we've selected as being what we saw as the best fit at that point. And therefore, um, I was perfectly willing to discuss any other options that they came up with. Um, and originally, they said they would come up with other options, um, and they would come back to us. And that unfortunately never happened, and they never came back with other. That came. They came I'm, back I'm with. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, again, remind the public this is not uh, a meeting in public. Not a public meeting. Uh, we gave the respect to the objectors to have their chance to speak. I now expect the same respect for those who are proposing the plan, please. Um, so it's unfortunate that they didn't come back with any um, proposals. The one, the only thing they did do was um, do a, a poll round the objectors um, and they said would you be happy with a plan that put the shed two kilometres away or more from the village. Um, they did this with the knowledge that I'd given them the farm map and one very tiny corner of our farm it, it, it comes in with that two kilometre uh, with that two kilometre boundary. Unfortunately it's then within 400 metres of a house which is against um, the regulations of, of far for um, this type of building um, to be built. So it was an untenable question to put to them. Um, so we had selected what we thought was the best one with regard to water courses, with regard to um, uh, woodland and visual shelter, and with regard um, to uh, distances away from housing. Um, so we had done that within um, our land ownership. And as I say, I was perfectly willing to, to um, look at any other options that were put in front of me. Okay, I, 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 thank you for that, and I, and I hear what you say. Uh, I'm sorry, Vice Convener, but it's quite important to my understanding if I, uh, if I can get clarity on this map and whether I can take it to him or he can come to me or whatever. No, please do. Right. I'm on my way. <laughs> I'm sure if you want me to come over. I'll come and do it. Councillor Drysdale, sorry, Councillor Drysdale, could, could we hold it up so we could? <laughs> oh. Can we, I'm sorry, can we actually see this now? I'm sorry. You'll have to come a bit closer. <laughs> Even my glasses don't work that <laughs> well. <laughs> okay, so, um, uh, yep, yep, okay. So essentially what we're saying is this whole area in the Lake Shore Ring is now ceased occupation. No, it's not. Come in on the wind. Do you want to comment on the wind? 
um, you know, on, on the wind, um, the prevailing wind is westerly, southwesterly. What we see there quite clearly is that the, the, the village is, is north, northeast, um, if you like. So the bulk of the prevailing wind actually travels to the, to the southern <coughs> um, uh, part of the, to the south of the village, rather than going straight through the north village, as you, as you see portrayed. And we've got wind data from Arthur, which we spoke to the, to the site, if, uh, um, which I thought that's worthwhile. Okay, now I'm back at my microphone, thank you. Um, my, se my second question was, um, sorry, I forgot the name of your... Uh, Malcolm Sharp. Malcolm, thank you. <laughs> um, you mentioned uh, that, uh, I think the words you used were a few hens in... in in the fields. Yes. Um, what's 20% of 32,000? A few hens. 6,400, I think. 6,400, you're right, yes. <laughs> More than a few. Thank you. In, in a 16 hectare range, that's, that's very few. The application is also not about the, the range in agricultural use of an agricultural field. Thank you. Councillor Ben. Thank you, Vice Convener. Uh, I am the archetypal typal individual who worked in the poultry industry 45 years ago, nevertheless 20 or 30 years ago. Um, so diversity for the farm, is it not? Yes. How many additional individuals are you expecting to employ? Now there's two full-time jobs equivalent. So there's two full-time jobs um, will come with this um, development um, directly. Um, obviously there's plus... Um, uh, other jobs in the building and, and downstream from there. And, and yes, it's a, it's a diversification of the farm. Um, potatoes is our mainstay of our business. The consumption of potatoes declines by one or two percent in the UK every year. Um, the consumption of eggs is currently rising by four or five percent um, in the UK at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Councillor Anderson. Uh, thank you, yeah. Uh, Vice Convener. I've got a couple of questions. Um, I don't want to be pedantic on the, the traffic movements, but obviously if you've got workers, they'll need to travel in and out. Uh, so um, possibly another two or three vehicle movements a day. On That's right. I, um, if, if, you, if both workers arrive at, um, and are coming by car, there'll be two car movements the in the morning. Well, two in the, evening. the workers will be Sorry. one at a time. Um, the workers won't be there together, um, if you like. Um, uh, another thing, I, I do realise that, that, that out with this um, 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 application is the, is the grazing, but yet um, there's a lot of concern about the chickens impacting on the area, and one of the things was beside uh, close to water courses. When you are fencing, and you say it's agricultural fencing, so it won't need planning permission, it's not going to be a big six foot high chain link for the sounds of things. Um, how far away from water courses do you plan to have the fencing? Yeah, I'm sure there'll be some somewhere in deep in, in regulations. There'll be a, a distance for chickens to be away from a water course, um, so I'd imagine. And also, um, I mentioned, will all the traffic, wh however much it is, I'll work it out once I've done this, will all them have to come through the village? Yes, yeah, so on the traffic point, um, it's been raised a couple of times. The reason that uh, we built a shed um, in 1996 all through the planning process and through a public consultation within that planning process, um, the, the traffic management was changed um, to suit the public at that time. Our um, plan, and my father's plan in 1996, was to bring all traffic in and out of East Ardler Farm down, up and down Station Road, which is the road immediately to the left-hand side 
of the, the grey buildings there um, on site and we were going to put passing places in on that road to facilitate that. But through public consultation within that, um, it, was, it was decided um, that no, they would rather have a one-way system and, and therefore all traffic into East Ardler Farm um, now has to um, go through Ardler, in through Ardler and out through Station Road. Um, my understanding is that is a planning condition that was imposed upon us in 1996 and that we have rigorously stuck to since then. Therefore, it is my understanding that um, to comply with that one-way system, um, the, the traffic for this site also has to, has to follow that, that one-way route, if you like. But it was, it was done not at our request, it was done at the request of local people um, at the time. Thank you. Thank you for the clarity. Do we have any further questions? No. Thank you, gentlemen, lady. Thank you. Thank you for your Thank time. You. We'll now go to uh, questions for officers. Councillor Drysdale. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vice Convener. Uh, and I have two or three questions here, if I may. Um, firstly, turning to page 94 of our papers, an environmental impact assessment section, uh, where it concludes that uh, an environmental impact assessment uh, was not required. Uh, whereas, uh, clearly, we have heard from local residents uh, their concerns uh, about the environmental impact. Can I just ask for a bit more clarity on why an EIA was, uh, was not sought in this case? Yes, uh, when we received the proposal and um, we had the screening opinion was done looking at um, all the regulations, looking at the proposal, everything that was required by it. And as you'll see in paragraph 10 there, it explains that although um, it does fall, as I say, um, in schedule two of the development due to the size of the proposed building, once everything else was taken into consideration, all the characteristics that are required under the regulations, it was considered that it was not required to be an EIA development. Okay, thank you. Um, I now want to turn to uh, the section on prime agricultural land uh, and paragraph 94, which uh, starts by making clear that policy ER5 states that development will not be permitted on prime agricultural land, etc., etc., and I don't need to go through everything that it says there. Um, given the relevance of, of, of that policy ER5 to our considerations today, I'm wondering why that has not been highlighted as uh, one of the policies uh, relevant to this application earlier in the paper. That is a, that's a mission in the paper. I mean, clearly in the report we have referred to it. Um, in terms of prime agricultural land, Um, in terms of prime ag agricultural land, the area that's part of the application site is class two. Um, and we certainly looked at that and whether or not, if this was, for example, the only part of the area that was class two, there may have been a different view taken on it. But when you're looking at the whole area around that part of uh, Perth and Kinross, it is all prime agricultural land and therefore it is reasonable to allow a small portion of that for the agricultural diversification to allow for a proposal like this. So apologies, it's an omission in terms of having it in part of the, the listing of the policies, but it was clearly assessed in the report as part of the proposal that's been put forward today. I, I fully accept um, the apology. However, I mean, I, I think it is, I think members, uh, colleagues will recognise that it is very important that they understand uh, the, uh, the detail of that policy in the same way as they've been asked to look at the other uh, policies that are, that are explained in full in the paper. And, you know, it's, in, in, in my opinion, a, um, a, a significant omission. Councillor Drysdale, sorry, this is a question. Yes, indeed. So my final question 
is in relation to um, where are we now? Uh, paragraph 65, which relates to noise and odour, uh, and, and which makes reference to the Scottish Government's guidance, which I think is from 2005, uh, regarding the prevention of environmental pollution from agricultural uh, activity. Um, it stated that uh, it recommends a minimum of 400 metres separation distance from uh, livestock buildings, etc., etc. Um, would you agree that uh, section 13.14 of that Scottish Government guidance clearly states that where possible, sites downwind of residential areas should be chosen? Yes, I mean, we're looking at um, the proposal here and the distances that you have. And I think it's been referred to by both objectors and by the um, applicant and agent with regard to the distances we've got. And we are beyond the 400 metre um, area and the distance that is detailed in a lot of the regulations. Um, we're looking at the nearest receptor, residential receptor, which is a sensitive building, um, being 520 metres from the proposed development. Um, I don't know if my colleague in environmental health, Ms. Reid, has anything further to add on that with regard to the, the noise, odour and regulations. Um, we looked at the application and we looked at the guidance and the closest residential property was approximately 520 metres away. Um, therefore, we deemed that there would be no issues with regard to odour and noise. Um, we have set um, conditions um, with regards to an odour management plan and a noise management plan and there is also a condition for plant noise. Thank you. Uh, um, a further question follows on from that if I may. which is, Would you accept that the Scottish Government guidance it, yes it absolutely mentions the, the minimum distance of 400 metres has been brought out but separately and additionally it makes reference to where possible sites downwind of uh, residential areas, uh, where possible sites downwind of residential areas should be chosen. And would you agree that we have uh, had demonstrated today by the owners that there are other areas that are not, um, that will not cause the same level of potential difficulty in terms of um, wind transference of noise and odour? I agree that the, the, the guidance does state preferably downwind, um, however in some circumstances that is not feasible, but with regard to the, the building in question, um, the odour control within that building, um, I still don't see that there, there would be an issue due to the system that's been put in place which right. is a be best available Again, technology. Again, I don't think that's well. addressing the question I'm, uh, I'm posing. Councillor Anderson. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Vice Convener. Um, back to the, the, the um, issue of the roads. Uh, I've managed to work it out now. There'll be 21 additional journeys per week on this uh, road uh, with this um, development. Is the road capable of standing up to 21 additional journeys per week? I'm not sure, sure we, quite sure where you're getting the 21 vehicles from. That's not um, my understanding from from the report. Um, the road itself, the existing road, it's, it's a public road. Um, at present, there are no restrictions on HGV vehicles. Um, there are no formal passing places. Um, there are a few um, field accesses, etc. But... <coughs> The, the, the operational traffic per week is very low for, for this type of um, development and we, we do not feel that there would be an issue on this road. We have consulted our um, road safety colleagues. There are no uh, recorded accident history for this site. Um, the road itself is 4.5 to 5.6 metres wide. Um, and as I say, with the, with the, the low traffic, we do not feel that 
going to be an issue here. Yeah, j just to explain to you, the reason I came to 21 is you've got seven vehicles per week, six to seven vehicles per week, which were lorries uh, supplying food, uh, taking waste away, etc., etc. Plus, you've got one employee per day travelling back and forward. So that's f another 14, so that makes 21 in my uh, sums um, per week. Um, and, and, and that's what I was alluding to. Um, but uh, yes, that, that's um, fine with that. The other thing is, uh, is, uh, is uh, the people in transport aware of this one-way system? Is this a road statute regulations? And is that a, a definitely a green 40 mile an hour route? that we're discussing once you come out of the... the that that is a cycling and friendly route, um, which was introduced by our colleagues in road safety. Um, as I say, our road safety colleagues have been um, consulted on this development and have no issues themselves. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's another question. Yeah. Um, uh, another... A point I want to raise is that um, uh, we have had um, various emails and someone pointed out that um, um, another poultry um, development was re was rejected. But when I read through it, it was rejected because of the proximity of a triple SI uh, site. Um, this was not in Scotland. Is there any triple SI sites close proximity to this uh, development? No, there's not. Thank you. I'll, I'll leave it at that, I think. Councillor Waters, do you have a question? Thank you, Vice Convener. Uh, just, just uh, Councillor Anderson uh, dealt with some of the questions, but I just, just want to go back to the, to the, uh, the Keeler Road. Uh, on, a quick, on a quick measurement on, on the GIS system here, it's about 560 metres, very roughly and very quickly done. Uh, Mr. Mr. Ellis, in his, his submission, sat and said that there's, 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 and yourself said there's no formal passing places or anything like that, and there's ditches. What, what is the, wh what is the state of the road that to get comfort that if, if on the, given the length of the road, if uh, tr traffic meets coming head on, it's a long way to reverse if you get two trucks um, coming. Is is that is that a fair assessment that the, that that there is a potential an issue with that? There is the potential for um, that issue to arise, which is the same kind of issues that happen on any rural roads of this, this uh, width that we have um, nowadays. Th as I say, there are no formal passing places. Um, there are a few uh, field accesses, which, and clearly there has been a little bit of um, verge overrun, um, which has taken place. In terms of... Um, whether that could cause great conge congestion, for example. Um, I think there's a little bit of give and take. I think the, the vehicle quantities that we're talking about here, it's not any different from existing situations that we have in many other places. Um, as, as I say, we have, we've put these questions to our road safety colleagues um, and there's, there is no issue there as far as they're concerned. Um, Just, just a quick supplementary on on um, uh, uh, competence or something like that. If, if, if uh, you know, if we were minded to pass this, and and uh, you know, I, 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 you know, if I, I accept that no congestion because of the amount of traffic, but there could be a lot of inconvenience, and, and we don't want to create inconvenience. As part of this application, is it is it is it co competent to put a condition in that would that would uh, uh, allow a, a proper passing place? At, at halfway halfway down the road to to at, you know half a kilometre or just over is a long distance if somebody's got to reverse for a good bit of that. But if you could half it, then it would it would certainly. It would be competent um, in as much as on certainly from the plan that we have on one side of the the road is under the ownership of the applicant. Um, I would suggest that from the information that we've been given by our colleagues that it wouldn't be necessary, but as I say, it would be competent. Uh, you will see that in our recommendation, there is a condition with regard, a condition two, I think it is, with regard to traffic management. Yes, condition two, with regard to the traffic management. Um, this would 
certainly help with regard to any of the larger vehicles going towards the proposed development. What you can't legislate for is any large vehicles which may be going to the settlement of, of Keeler. But we're not, within this development, you're not going to have two large vehicles on going to the development at the same time because that would be controlled through condition two of the traffic management plan. Any further questions? No. Then we'll move to comment. Do I have any comments from members, please? Councillor Ingworth. Thank you, Vice Convener. Um, the applicant mentioned development in Abernethy. Uh, Abernethy is very close to where I live. When that was built, probably last year, it will generate an awful lot of concern from villagers, but since it's been built, there's been not a peep. I walk past it regularly with the dog. It is a very well-run, very um, non-obtrusive uh, operation, so it, it really hasn't generated the amount of noise or complaints uh, that we thought it would. Councillor Drysdale. Thank you, Convener. Uh, if I may, I'd like to uh, propose a motion. Please go ahead. Uh, I would like to propose a uh, refusal of uh, this application on the following grounds. Uh, firstly, um, contravention of policy PM1A placemaking. Uh, I believe that the strength of feeling demonstrated by those attending today and those who uh, have made their contributions uh, from the local community makes it very clear that those who live in the community do not believe that the um, proposal uh, contributes positively to the quality of the surrounding environment. Uh, I, I further consider that the proposal, if I can find it, uh, breaches two further policies. Firstly, policy EP8, uh, noise pollution, uh, where there is a presumption against the siting of proposals that which will generate high levels of noise. Uh, and we've established that uh, uh, around 20% of 32,000 uh, chickens may be out and about at any given time uh, and uh, I can't see that being a, a, a quiet situation. I believe that, that the level of noise generated by that activity will be significant. Uh, and, and thirdly, uh, the, the issue of um, policy ER5, which was um, not highlighted in the report, but uh, as much as it should have been, uh, and I believe that uh, for the reasons that I've already illustrated uh, and, point and made reference to with the Scottish Government guidance uh, around uh, where possible, and we've just demonstrated it is, pos it is possible, uh, allocation should, um, should not result in uh, any noise and odour um, being transferred to a built-up area. Uh, and we, we see that precisely that will happen according to the prevailing uh, wind directions. So for, all, for these three reasons, I recommend refusal. Thank you. Do we have a seconder for that? It, fa it falls in, I'm afraid. Do we have a motion? To Yes, thank you, Vice Convener. Uh, I would recommend approval of this application. I really do think, and I say this from a lot of experience, both of chicken farms, farming in general, and small country roads uh, servicing such places, that the noise and odour and the anticipated adverse effects have been very much over-egged, if I may say, um, because they simply will not materialise. Uh, on occasion, you will smell chicken farms, and it's invariably not a chicken farm you smell. It's someone spreading the, the excrement from the chicken farm rather than the chicken farm itself. And I really do not think it will be a problem. It's a rural area. Uh, it will provide jobs. And I, uh, Mr. Ellis said that the historically sorry, planned... Uh, sorry, I've mentioned again, members of the public are not to participate. Please. 
Thank you. Just Sorry, um, Mr. Ellis did mention it was historically planned rural villages. Historically planned rural villages were built around farming environments where most people in the village worked on these farms one way or another. And it, <laughs> it is incumbent on a village to accept that everything that happens on a farm, if it is not having an adverse effect or can be proven to have one uh, on the village, must accept that these activities are legitimate. And to my mind, it is legitimate. And I, I cannot foresee uh, any difficulty, as was suggested near Abernethy, uh, in the near future from the building of this. I'm happy to approve the paper. Thank you. Do I have a second there? Councillor Anderson. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, Vice Convener, uh, I would second this. Um, the, the actual poultry industry has come a long, long way in, in, in the last 20 years, and uh, there's been lots of uh, regulations put in that control odour, um, noise, etc. And uh, I'm sure that uh, we should be um, quite uh, comforted that the fact that uh, we now have free range uh, rather than battery chickens, because when one looks at the horrific uh, uh, film uh, footage of uh, the processes that was used in the 70s and 80s, maybe even up to the 90s, uh, and we're now going to this uh, form of uh, uh, chicken uh, rearing and egg production, uh, it's far better. And, uh, uh, we uh, in Bridge of Ern at one time had an old unit in the middle of the village and uh, it was only when uh, it was mucked out uh, twice a year that there was odour and we had to put up with it because we were in uh, a rural village, uh, though it's very close to Perth. Um, Ardler um, is in the same. Um, I don't think that uh, once this uh, uh, development is in place that they'll be near the issues that uh, has been suggested. So therefore, I would second uh, this motion. There is an amendment there, or is it a motion? I'm not sure. <laughs> I would ask if there is an amendment. Point of order. Thank you, Mr. Vice Convener. Uh, I, I, I return to the, uh, the issue uh, that I highlighted in my previous comments regarding um, policy ER5 and the absence of an explanation of to what that local development plan policy is uh, to elected members on this committee. I believe that is a significant omission uh, and therefore uh, would ask that the paper be withdrawn and then resubmitted based on full information to, uh, to the committee. Is that a motion for deferral? Uh, it's a, no, it's a point of order at the moment. Uh, I, I'm, I'm seeking clarification uh, because of a significant omission in the paper, um, w whether it is competent for us to, to consider that without the full facts before us. Councillor Drysdale, I think um, Mrs Conliffe has already answered your questions on that and there is reference in the report to the prime agricultural land. Um, so I think it's a matter for members to proceed to either when you make a motion to defer, uh, sorry, I'll rephrase that, and there's already a, a motion to grant. It's a matter for you whether you wish to put forward a motion for deferral and to obviously put forward the grounds for that. Okay, so in that case, I move deferral on the grounds just stated. Do we have a seconder for that? Given we have no amendments, the application is passed. Thank you. And may I record my objection? Thank you. Mainly. Dissent then. Members, we've been asked for a short break by one of the members. We'll have a short recess for five minutes. Members will reconvene uh, with the next application paper. Uh, we now have uh, number 524, which is the erection of four dwelling houses, 10 flats, 
been a cycle storage, fencing, gates, formation of steps, parking area, landscaping, and associated works at land at the disused Bowling Green and 42 Mitchell Street, Creef. And I'll ask Mr. Scott to introduce. Thank you, Vice Convener. Yes, um, Planning Commission is sought, as you've set out there, for the erection of four uh, dwelling houses and a flat. The site itself is located within the Creef settlement boundary, uh, and indeed it's actually within the Creef conservation area. From the point of access, which you'll see on the right-hand side of the screen there, that's an existing access. So just to give you uh, um, geography of the situation, that's about 150 metres down the road on Mitchell Street to get to Creef Town Centre from the application site. Um, the application site, as you'll note again from the papers, there is a planning permission that's extant on the site, which was granted from a 2006 application. That was for the erection of five dwellings. Um, one of those has been erected, so you'll see almost centrally within the site marked existing house. That's one McGlashan Gardens, which is effectively the one, only one of five that's been built out from that permission. But because it's been implemented, the permission is there in perpetuity um, for the remaining residential dwellings of the four. Um, so the, the land use uh, as such for residential use has been established through that permission. But I'll take you through some slides just to show you the, the locality and how this development would fit in within the, the proposed site. This is taken from Mitchell Street. This is the existing access um, which would lead on to the site and indeed it was the same access for the extant permission. Uh, it is uh, particularly wide and uh, as you can see, but there are proposals to make sure it's upgraded and provide an entrance feature within the development. To the right of shot, uh, you can see there's a stone boundary wall there. It's actually the uh, boundary line for a residential core. It's Strathern Core, a number of properties in order of around 40 uh, adjacent to the site. And again, you can see on the left-hand side, there's a number of residential properties on Mitchell Street. Moving further up the same lane, uh, this is the existing house that I mentioned earlier. So this is one McGlashan Gardens. The proposed access to the site itself is on the right-hand side, uh, just beyond where the Jeep is parked within the uh, shot of the photo. Uh, the site itself, as you can see from this uh, slide, there are uh, an existing landscaping scheme which uh, bounds many sides of the site. So I'll just point out where they exist and what that might mean for the development moving forward. This is taken from the rear gardening ground of uh, One McGlashan Gardens, that existing dwelling. This is looking north across the site. Um, you can see there are residential properties just beyond the boundary. Uh, the one peeking through from the, the landscaping there is known as Leafield. Uh, so that is, as I say, directly north of the proposed application site. So swinging around in uh, 90 degrees, now looking directly west across the site, so along the boundary of One McGlashan Gardens. So you can see the extent almost of the entire site from here. So behind shot is the eastern boundary with uh, Strathairn Court, uh, sorry, Gardens, and this is looking towards uh, Miller Street. So the tree line you've got there is the common boundary on the west of the application site with properties on Miller Street. The trees on the right have shot there. Uh, essentially, it's a hedgerow from the site's uh, previous uh, use, which was a bowling green historically beyond that line. So that's essentially a hedgerow from the previous use of the site. Uh, a part of the proposal would be to remove uh, those trees in that locality to facilitate the erection of some of the dwelling houses. This is taken from the southwest of the site. Uh, again, this is on the southern boundary, which would be the shared boundary, the trees on the right of shot with uh, Mitchell Street, and this is again looking back at uh, the one McGlashan Gardens existing house that has been built out. Slightly further north uh, within the site, this is just further north where the last shot was. So again, looking at the northern boundary, uh, you can see a number of properties which uh, exist beyond the boundary. Uh, the white property with the, the pitch roof, which you can see in shot there, is known as the Lee, uh, and beyond it to the left, uh, is Belmont, it's the red sandstone building again with a slightly higher uh, pitch roof and a number of properties beyond that. So clearly there are residential properties essentially on all sides of this application site. So consideration about the layout has given cognizance of the existing residential properties. From this slide you can see that um, ground levels or conditions vary. It's become overgrown from its previous use as a bowling green. Uh, there are areas of soil which have been removed to form the, the development that's taken place thus far, but the proposal uh, does set out the, the levels that are proposed as part of the development, and again, landscaping which would be required to be retained or enhanced as part of the proposal. This is taken back to the proposed site plan, so just to clarify, the existing access for vehicular purposes would come off Mitchell Street. 
uh, it, would, it would come into the, the development and it would terminate at the uh, southern boundary with Miller Street uh, properties bounding onto it. And there'd be a turning uh, function provided there for refuse vehicles, emergency vehicles, uh, and the parking area in that locality. Uh, and just to the left of that, which is in the southeast corner of the site, it's uh, proposed to provide a pedestrian link through an existing pathway that exists back on to uh, Miller Street. Uh, again, that pathway would have been historically used, I believe, for the, the Bowling Green, but the proposals before you today do propose to retain that to provide an alternative non-vehicular access to the town centre, which advises in the order of 150 metres from the application site at that point. And just to clarify, members probably will have received an update um, in terms of the revised planning conditions. Two amendments are proposed in minor nature to condition four for the wording for the contaminated land condition and also condition 11, which would be supplementing, sorry, replacing the existing landscaping condition rather than implementing what's been submitted. It would require further detail to come to uh, planning officers to consider. Do members all have, acts have had access to the updates? I can ask Mr. Simpson to circulate those for you, and if you want to take a moment to consider those. Yes, I do apologise. Got my colleague's surname incorrect there. Young men with beards all look the same. <laughs> yeah. I would like to move a direct negative to that. <laughs> that's not, that's not correct. And why discriminate them by mentioning young men? One time. So as I've highlighted, there are two amendments, very minor in nature for condition four. It's simply uh, typographical errors being corrected and condition 11 is just requiring details of the landscaping to come forward. You'll see from the proposed site plan on the screen, there are some landscaping proposals indicated. It's just to get certainty about what's going to happen in terms of what's being retained and what's being proposed. Uh, and that would allow us to make sure the development uh, accords with an approved landscaping plan. Require some time to read it, or are you happy to proceed? We have uh, deputations on this paper. Uh, could I ask uh, Mrs. Kirk to come forward, please? Mrs. Kirk, you have uh, five minutes, as everybody else has, and we'll give you a warning when there's one minute left to go. That's uh, over to you. Good afternoon. I am Vilma Kirk of the Lee, Fern Tower Road, and I'm here today to object to the proposed plans on the following grounds. One, privacy, two, design, and three, congestion. On privacy, the Lee will be affected by the development on site, in particular, house plot four and the blocks of flats bordering my property. The design of the house on plot four has very large double height windows, which will look directly onto the side elevation of the Lee and will give the occupant a direct view into two of my bedrooms my kitchen and my utility room. I also consider that the proposed block of flats adjacent to my property, which also have double height large windows and glass stairwells, will allow a view directly into our main living room. I consider this loss of privacy will have a negative impact on my family's enjoyment of our dwelling. Design, the visual impact of the development is not in keeping with the surrounding properties and their traditional design. The blocks of flats in particular have very large windows, unlike many of the surrounding properties, and will therefore detract from the overall visual appearance of the locality. I am concerned about the overbearing nature of the block of flats along the east boundary of my site. The difference in ground level between the two sites will add to the apparent height of this block of flats, increasing their visual dominance. Congestion, the streets surrounding the proposed development are already extremely congested with much on-street parking resulting in some streets being reduced in effect to a single lane. Whilst I acknowledge that the site does provide a number of parking places, the addition of potentially 30 or more cars travelling around these streets can only add to this problem. 
whilst we are objecting to this particular development, we accept the need for more housing and would not object to a more sympathetic, less dense development which would enhance the local area. I would now like to draw your attention to the additional concerns of my neighbours. The design of the houses and flats do not, in our opinion, meet the conservation criteria to preserve or enhance the character of the area. The design is not in keeping with the surrounding stone-built properties, and the overall modern finish of the proposed dwellings will detract from the historic ambience of the area. The proposal indicates that the upper floor windows are only to provide light to the void above the lounge area. However, the plans clearly show a window of a bedroom directly opposite the upper storey of the window, which does create overlooking onto adjacent properties. This site is an area of natural wilderness as numerous birds and insects are bound together with an overwintering area for numerous amphibians. The reduction on natural environment will have a detrimental effect on the local insect population, which in turn will affect the bat population area, mostly living in the local church tower. I thank you for this opportunity to present my case and that of my neighbours against this particular development. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Kirk. If you can stay there for any questions. Do we have any questions from Councillor Wilson? Councillor Wilson. Thanks for your presentation and your patience. Um, you said you weren't averse to residential development, and yes. you said, I think, something about the density of what's proposed. Do you want to say a wee bit more yes, about that? Yes, I, I think um, we've been in this house four and a half years, and when we bought the property and looked at buying the property, we were, we were aware that the development on our boundary would be a housing development. But at that time, it was a development for five houses, I think five houses, of the type that was shown the existing one that's on the plot, they were of that type, and the, they had balconies which were facing the other way, and plans had gone ahead for that, and there was no objection. I think there was some problem with the funding and what have you, and uh, th these houses never happened. But at that, that type of development would cause no problem whatsoever for us. We were more than happy with these houses. But then that development didn't happen, and then this development appeared, which is completely opposite to, to everything else round about. Um, and really, the visual impact on my house is just incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Councillor Gray. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Kirk. Um, can you tell me, you mentioned overlooking and distance from your own property in yes. particular. Uh, do you know the distance that this uh, will be from your own house? Not exactly. I think the, the house the house on plot four, which is um, my house is sort of the third green dot up, <laughs> that house is, I think it's probably about nine, nine metres or something like that. But it's they're going to be higher than my house, and then they're going to have these windows top to bottom. And that is the side that looks directly into my bedrooms and my kitchen and then round to my main living area. I'm totally over I'll be totally overlooked. I have no privacy in these rooms whatsoever. Thank you. Any further questions, Mrs. Kirk? Mrs. Kirk? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Atwood. Councillor Gray, could you turn your mic off? I'm so sorry. <laughs> right, can I invite uh, Mr Stewart to come forward, please? He's uh, appearing on behalf of the applicant. <coughs> Again, Mr Stewart, you have five minutes, and uh, we'll give you a one-minute one minute warning when you're close to the end. Thanks very much. Uh, this is our architect, Andrew Taylor, to uh, ask any, uh, answer any questions that you may have. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to speak to our planning application for 14 dwellings at the old Bowling Green site Mitchell Street Creef. Uh, first I'd like to express my gratitude to the exemplary handling of our planning application by the local authority and its various individuals. We have had excellent collaborative and constructive dialogue throughout the planning process. My wife Louise and I have been building new build homes and undertaking renovations over 30 years in Perthshire, East Central Scotland and the Scottish Borders and have won many awards for our efforts. We always seek to tailor our developments to the specific sites we're involved in. 
offering something that's not available from the national house builders, <coughs> more bespoke service uh, provided along the way. We believe this is an exciting opportunity to create a new development to a very high quality of finish with a distinctive character in an excellent location very close to all the town's amenities and transport links. It's an excellent opportunity also to improve the site which is currently overgrown and sitting in limbo with its current consent. The development will bring economic benefit to the local workforce in the short term and in the long term to the town from the future occupiers of the development. This site currently has planning consent for a product that was driven by the pre-crash housing boom and in its current form is simply no longer viable, nor is it an efficient use of a town centre site. Our initial redesign of the site, we reviewed the current housing market and found that uh, downsizers were a significant part of that with a small number of detached homes. <coughs> Through dialogue with the council, we were able to amend our initial planning application which attracted various objections and with their help and collaboration created a reworking of the scheme and that would warrant recommendation for approval which they have since done. The changes we were made to address the objections and make sure we complied with the relevant requirements of the council's planning policies. As a local developer from Perthshire we are also keen to get on with our neighbours and as such believe we have addressed their concerns were valid. Some of the items that we addressed were um, re reducing the um, initial application from three storeys to two storeys for the flats. Um, we also brought the numbers down from 12 to 10. Um, given that it is, <coughs> it is a contemporary design, the low 10 degree pitch of the roofs has a much um, reduced shading effect on neighbouring properties. Um, air quality was a topic that was raised and we have had an assessment done on that and uh, what we have to do is look after the air quality and dust management through the development, otherwise there's no objection. We've introduced electric vehicle charging points for each property to encourage occupants to change over to electric vehicles and to be future proof for the government strategy to phase out new petrol and diesel cars by 2032. Um, our central heating boilers will be ultra low nitrogen oxide output and we've removed the multi-fuel stoves in our initial application because of the latest um, uh, move away from the particulate emissions that they produce. Uh, in summary, we believe that our proposed development is one of high quality of design and layout, has addressed the comments and concerns of our neighbours and complies with the various planning policies as demonstrated. It's a modern, sustainable de uh, development of class leading specification and will provide a small but important contribution to housing supply and it will greatly improve upon the development site which has been blighted for the last 10 years with their current consent. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to the application, happily respond to any One questions minute. and our architect uh, Andrew Taylor of that studio is also available for comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think Councillor McCall has a question. Yes, I do. Um, and and it's, it stems from the fact that you said that you, you, you tailor the site for, for, um, for, for what's there. Given the uh, um, information that's come forward from Mrs Kirk regarding the, the height of the windows and, and, and the overlooking of, of her house, I was just wondering what you could comment on that. And if you have tailor made it to the, to the site, I'm, I'm interested yes, in your comment over the, uh, the height of the windows, knowing the proximity of the existing building. In tailoring the, the properties to a particular site and, and location, often we're found to be competing against the nationals, and that's something we can't do. So we have to offer a product that is um, away from what the national sort of boxes and, and sort of um, uh, just rubber stamping the same product throughout. So we have to come up with something different, something better, higher specification, and so on. And that's why we went towards the contemporary, which virtually few of the nationals are doing other than in the city centres effectively you know so it's more from that point of view that we're trying to produce a product that we don't find down the road that a national's selling and, and we can't build them as cheaply and they can't undercut the prices and so on so it's really bespoke in that respect. Yeah, in terms of over looking I, I keep buying all the things that the, the, the neighbours have put up and I think it's the same as it was before so it's in other aspects of the court it's the understanding of the, the living space and the back of the house is well one thing and what I mean in terms of the quality of the setbacks I think there is no 
view. Sorry, could you get closer to the microphone? <laughs> uh, so there's no view um, from within the house at upper level into the neighbouring property. So that distance is actually, the viewing distance is actually much, much further away. So uh, we, we believe the privacy aspect's not affected. Sorry, just, just for clarity. Um, so the, the you're saying it's double aspect at the back? Double height. Double height the at the back, sorry. So, so it's effectively the, the, the upper floor layout doesn't meet the external wall. So within the space, the living space is double height. The bedrooms at the back, which would benefit, would potentially have been able to see through to the rear elevation window, they're not up against that wall. That, that window at upper level is simply to bring light down into the double height space. The views are all at ground floor level, so it's single story as well. Councillor Gray. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Can you tell me, please, I'm reading uh, page 129, paragraph 51. Uh, and just the, t the quickest way of uh, adding up how many uh, parking spaces there will be. Uh, do you know how many there are parking spaces or garages within the development? 36. 36. 36. Yeah. I, I, I mentioned this because congestion was mentioned, mentioned as a problem. I know Creef is a very congested place, but uh, it's, to it's have a that steering number. from the, the local authority have the guidelines and parking requirements. It's a steering from them in terms of for the physical apartments and the houses themselves. The, the apartment is two each, and the houses, I think they're three each, um, two being on drive and one being in the garage. And then there are visitor spaces beyond that, which I think are four in number. So they've been calculated and applied equally in equity rate as well, so it's like three flagging each. I'm afraid. <laughs> Councillor Waters, do you have a question? Yeah, thank you, Vice Convener. Um, you've given some some um, uh, insight or some glimpses of part of the answer to this, but just just uh, regarding you know quite quite contemporary design in the in the houses and given they are in tree conservation area, can I just un uh, explain why why you would do such a contemporary design in a in a conservation area? I, I think I, I would hail back to um, the fact that as an SME um, developer. We, if we produce a product that is effectively akin to the nationals, we don't stand a chance because they build them cheaper. Um, they just sort of replicate them and so on. So we have to build something that's different um, but of very high quality. The, the it's, it's partially dr uh, driven too by the high efficiency of the houses. We're proposing to use a, a product that's very highly used in Europe, which is a clay monolithic structure which is very good um, insulation in the winter time and also very cooling in the summertime and so on and so forth. Um, and that kind of drives a, a more contemporary design as well, you know. So can I just, yes, from sure. an architectural point of view, um, really traditional buildings um, gain a lot of their character through their detailing, their um, uh, decorative elements, stonework and so on, which is often referred to, but economically it's, impossible to build new build buildings in vol any volume in stonework which which would create the same character so what you tend to end up with is a, a, a crude version which is potentially well certainly from a designer's point of view it's not as um, a good a solution as to adopt a contemporary approach which doesn't rely on the same kind of decoration to create its character yeah. any further questions Councillor Wilson uh, thanks, Vice Convener. Thanks for your presentation. I'm interested to know why you've gone for a mixed economy of, of different types on the site and why you didn't go for a number of dwelling houses, full stop. You've explained the market has changed and that then leads me to the question of why didn't you go for a, a more um, uniform news development throughout and, and miss out the, uh, the dwelling houses if, if they're not selling? No, I think that's a very fair comment. Um, uh, the way the spread is uh, looked at there is I think there is a, a capacity for, for downsizers as much as there is a capacity for detached properties. So I think a split was the sort of natural um, direction to go in for us. I think we, if we'd gone for um, downsizer apartments throughout the entire development, we might have had another six plus units and I, I think that would have extended the development period for the, the property um, and likewise detached properties um, there are a great number of them in Berkshire if you if you look on right near the Abbey four bedroom properties there's an awful lot of them these will be um, of a very high efficiency 
you know, a low uh, lo lifetime cost effectively for their property. So they're going to be partly aspirational in terms of people wanting to live in something that is a, a, an energy efficient product. Um, but I think, again, four um, is, is ample from that perspective. Any more in it would just delay it, you know. Thank you. No further questions? Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Members will now open up to questions for officers. Do we have any questions? Councillor Gray. Yes, uh, Mrs. Kirk's windows. Uh, could we have reference to the distances and the uh, a further opinion on that? Yeah, so she has identified that plot four, which is the closest to her property, um, her property sits off the boundary by a, a couple of metres. Uh, in terms of plot four, it, it sits from the face of the, the north uh, western boundary um, by 11 and a half metres. So on a ground floor, an upper floor, the, the window to window distances is 14 metres. So they are in excess of the council's uh, guidance within the placemaking standards, but picking up on the point that I believe the architect made there, for the ground floor properties, uh, clearly there's a degree of inter intervening landscape and fences, but for the upper floor, the bedrooms are actually set back 2.75 metres from the face of that full height glazing, so you're actually getting 16.75 metres from uh, the effective bedroom to bedroom distance, which is in excess of the, the guidelines. So we have recognised that that would be acceptable on that occasion. Um, turning to the other properties, which um, plot three, which is actually three mini blocks, if you like, of two, two bedroom flats each, uh, they obviously have a, a relationship and uh, look towards the garden ground of the Lee. So that garden ground from the real elevation to the bottom of their boundary uh, has those um, six properties over the two levels. At the closest point, the centre most uh, flatted properties is nine metres from the window to the boundary. So in those locations, it's the kitchen dining uh, on both floors that would be in within the closest proximity. But again, the nine metres meets the uh, council's guidance in terms of the, the, the window to boundary arrangements, <coughs> nine metres being the closest, and it, it gets further uh, for the block to the south, and indeed the one to the north between 10 and 11 metres respectively. So again, they all satisfy the requirements in terms of, of overlooking. Councillor Waters. Thank you, Vice Convener. J just, uh, can I just ask officers just the same question I asked the, the, the applicant, and that is, is, is why would we recommend such a, a contemporary design in a conservation area? Yeah, so the Council has a, a policy for development within conservation area, but that policy is set by the legal requirements. So Mrs Kirk correctly identified that the legal test is the desirability to preserve or enhance the conservation area. Being a, a backland development, it's not setting uh, a character that has to be uniform without a conservation area, and it doesn't necessarily seek to replicate individual houses. It's about the greater conservation area and its character. Um, so actually, the opportunity for a more innovative design is possible within a, a backland type development that we have here, because views from the conservation areas out with private cartilages are extremely limited. Um, so in terms of preservation, you don't actually adversely affect the character from the wider streetscape because you're, you're knitting in development within the rear areas of, of the town's fabric. Uh, and in terms of the other test enhancement, clearly design is subject, you know, there's a subjectivity to it, but the design statement submitted on behalf of the applicant, it does set out in terms of the parameters of why they've chosen the design that they have in terms of uh, fitting the development within within the site itself. And they have clearly and deliberately <coughs> gone for a modern development. I don't think that they are seeking to replicate or facsimile of the, the traditional properties. And to varying degrees, other development in the area ha has sought to try and replicate scale and form in terms of, I guess, the plot one from Aglashan, uh, and indeed the Lee being a slightly later house in itself. It has traditional proportions. So guidance in placemaking terms doesn't seek to curb innovation in terms of design, it actually seeks to encourage it. Um, there has been feedback in terms of policy shouldn't seek to constrain design, the design should be informed by what is capable within the site and we're quite satisfied that taking an innovative approach to the building design uh, and its aesthetic, that's not without the fact that they are using some traditional materials in terms of stone walling, et cetera, uh, that would complement that. We're quite satisfied that it would be an appropriate development uh, for this location, given its visibility and, and the, the approach they've taken to the design. 
Councillor McCall. Thank you, Acting Convener. Um, yeah, so we've, we've heard now that the, um, the distances fall within the guidelines, um, but I, I am uh, sympathetic with uh, Mrs. Kurt because obviously the position of her house next to the boundary will be uh, concerning. Um, but they, they do fall within the correct guidelines and parameters. Um, I guess the question I'm asking, with, with the uh, additional condition 11 regarding all, um, landscaping and detailed landscaping, um, can I have assurances from uh, officers if we were minded to go ahead that we could mitigate any overlooking concerns by making sure that the landscaping uh, took that into consideration? Yeah, beyond the core distances, there is mitigation in terms of the existing landscaping, which the plan in front of you shows a degree of retention, but that condition will allow us to ensure that there is a, you know, an additional buffer, perhaps, that would actually make sure that the relationship is minimised as far as possible. And similarly, there, are, there is a recommendation for a condition for levels of the development. Now, the applicant has stated what the levels are, um, but it's just to make sure that the relationship isn't adversely affected by a change in those levels. It's slightly lower, the site generally, I think, than the lee. So it's to make sure that you're not raising it up on a higher level, which would actually exacerbate any overlooking, thus diminishing the nine metres. So those two measures in themselves would provide mitigation in terms of making sure that the uh, amenity and overlooking is protected as demonstrated by the, the minimum of nine metres achieved <coughs> on this site. Are there any further questions? Then we'll move to debate. Before we go for a motion, are there any comments from any councillors? No, but I would actually like to, to, to move the paper with the uh, additional um, conditions that were circulated. Um, uh, as the, the distances between the properties and um, Mrs. Kirk, who is objecting, actually falls within the, the designated guidelines, um, it would not be competent to look at that. But we are taking into consideration mitigating um, evidence that will come forward on a detailed landscaping, and I I'd like to move the paper with that condition attached. Thank you. Do I have a seconder for that? I'm, I'm happy to second. I think I think it's a, you know it's an interesting design. I think it's from placemaking. I think it's a, a great little design. Um, yeah, very contemporary and and whatever. Uh, I, th I think the the. Uh, the concept to the houses and the, the energy efficiency and the renewable side, I think, is, is to be admired. So, happy to second that. Thank you. Do we have an amendment? Councillor Wilson. Convener, I'm conscious of the time and I'll be brief. Um, I'm not happy with, with, with approval. Um, I think the developer's trying to put too much into, in, into the area. Um, I understood the answer to my question about the mixture, but I still am uncomfortable with the mixture. So, for reasons that I've considered that there's, there's too, too much of a density of a development, and, and there's a degree of detrimental amenity to existing dwellings, um, particularly in relation to paragraph 58 and the, the, the distances um, to window to window. I won't narrate all of that, uh, Vice Convener, unless Mr. Ailett wants me to give further detail, but I don't think the um, plans we've got before us today um, comply with policy PM1A, placemaking, or policy PM1BA, or policy RD1, that's for residential areas, or policy HE3A for conservation areas. I couldn't give any more detail than these if, if, if. Could I just see if we have a seconder first of all before I go to Mr. Elliot? Do we have a seconder for motion? Councillor Simpson seconded it. Mr. Elliot, can I ask you for your views? Our articulation of the actual motion at the moment, I'm struggling. Um, you gave a couple of reasons, but then gave policy grounds. You need to bring them together in terms of which policy uh, you think is contravened and say why. Um, you have referred to um, too much in the area, and that presumes density. Um, um, uh, comments that I made in the early application remain relevant in the sense of you'd have to articulate why you think there's too much in there. Um, I'm not quite sure about that so far, Councillor Wilson. Okay. Um, first of all, on, on page 129, design and layout, um, I, I consider that the, 
that the design and layout don't comply with policy PM1A. Um, please make it. Um, perhaps, Councillor Wilson, if you, if, first of all, you're saying it's contrary to uh, policy PM1A, and that would be of the Perth and Cross Local Development Plan 2014. On the basis, and I've been through dealing with it in that, when you've mentioned four policy grounds, so if you could go through the four policy grounds. Right, I'm, I'm going to do that. Each. Yes. Do my best, yes. So in terms of PM1A, where do you think that they... In, in respect of design and layout? In what terms of design? What do you mean it by design and layout? I think there's the, the design and layout is, is cluttered. Um, it, it's too much density. Um, and I don't think it respects the... I'll come to the residential areas in a minute, but I don't think it it gives the the full potential for the site. Um, in respect of policy PM one B, please Sorry, make Councillor it. Wilson. I'm still on, on, on right, PM one okay. E. Right. Okay. Um, still struggling in terms of the wording. I'm afraid. Contrary to policy PM one E of Perth and Ross Local Plan 2014 on the basis. Um, you said cluttered and too much density. I'm not. Right, okay. I, I, I consider the development as proposed creates visual clutter. And. That's not quite sure what you mean by visual clutter, I'm afraid. <laughs> I think the words are self explanatory, convener, mm. vice convener, but um, if. If I think the design and layout is is contrary to policy PM one A, please make it. And I don't know what other thing I've got to say to express my opinion on that. I mean that I my view is there are too many too many houses in proposed for this for the site overall. And that helps Mr. Ellis, right? And that's a density issue, but it's also a design and layout issue. I think, Councillor, what I've got, sorry, what I've got there is contrast policy PM1A, Perth and Cross Local Plan 2014, on the basis, uh, oh sorry, uh, on the basis that the design and layout, sorry, sorry, on the basis that the development as proposed creates visual clutter by virtue of too many houses for the site. Yeah. Okay. That's in terms of PM1A. Right, I'm still on. I'm now. I'm PM 1B. Yes. Place maker. A. I do not consider that the proposal creates a sense of identity. In due to the design and layout. And presumably the visual clutter. That you yeah, yeah. The, the number of units and the visual clutter. Now in relation to policy RD1 residential areas, I, I do not consider that the proposal respects the residential amenity of adjacent dwellings. And on what basis? Is that the same basis? Due, due to the design and layout number of units yeah number of units proposed and now you also refer to policy HE3A the conservation area it, it says here in the report must preserve or enhance character or appearance I don't think the proposals do either again based on the number of units proposed in the plan Mr. Ellis' permission, I'll leave it at that, please come here. Okay. So, just to recap, what I have is, um, I think this is, of course, the amendment to refuse. It would be contrary to policy PM1A of Local Development Plan 2014 on the basis of the development as proposed creates visual clutter by virtue of too many houses for the site. And 
Secondly, contrary to PM1DA, as proposal wouldn't create a sense of identity due to the design layout for the number of units in the bigger clutter. Thirdly, contrary to policy RD1, because it wouldn't respect the um, residential amenity of the adjacent dwellings on the basis of the number of units proposed. And fourthly, contrary to policy HEPA, and that it would not preserve or enhance conservation area, that it would creep conservation area, of course, I think that would be correct, yeah, um, based on the number of units proposed for the site. I think I said pretty much everything that I want to say. Um, I, I accept the, uh, the understanding of, uh, of Councillor Wilson and uh, his opinions on the, the various uh, uh, policies that, that he says this, this contravenes, uh, which I, I totally uh, understand where, where he's coming from, but I do take it a, as an opinion. Um, I think that, um, as I say, that we were, we're moving forward with, with the proposal to mitigate the issues that would be caused by the, um, the possible overlooking. It falls within the, the agreed uh, plan and we wanted to take mitigated steps to make sure that that would keep the control within the council if this goes forward to any appeal. So um, that's the, the summing up. So I, I would sum up that we can move the motion. Okay, members, just to recap that you have a motion by Councillor We do tend to go into voting straight after. You could ask for comments, but I'll, I'll allow it this time for you. Yes. We did, we did ask for comments before the motion. We did ask. Well, on two different points, I, I'm, uh, I do consider it actually enhances this conservation area. Uh, it is different, but that doesn't necessarily mean it is wrong because it's in, in an area which is conserved. Uh, it is different, and I, I don't see objectionable. Another point is, it is in regarding density, uh, the density of housing there, I don't believe is any stronger than it is in Strathern House, which is uh, adjacent. Um, and the key point about this site is it is very close to the town centre. Uh, it has adequate parking within itself. It's very close to the town centre. And this is something we have striven to try and encourage throughout Berwick and Ross, is use town centres, people staying in town centres rather than on the fringes of towns, taking their cars into the town. Uh, the cars will be there and they won't need to use them to get to the town. Uh, these are the two points I was happy to present. Thank you. Members, the motion is to approve by Councillors McCall and Waters. The amendment is to refuse, by as I've mentioned before, by Councillors Wilson and Simpson. Thanks, good afternoon, members. Uh, if, when I call your name, you can state whether you'll be um, voting for the motion or the amendment, as just uh, summarised by uh, Mr. Elliot. Uh, and Again, this is in accordance with Standing Order 58. Councillor Anderson. Motion. Councillor Band. Motion. Councillor Brown. Motion. Councillor Drysdale. Motion. Councillor Gray. Motion. Councillor Illingworth. Motion. Councillor Jarvis. Motion. Councillor McCall. Motion. Councillor Simpson. Amendment. <coughs> Councillor Walters. And Councillor Wilson. Amendment. Members, that's nine in favour of the motion to grant, two in favour of the amendment to refuse, therefore the motion carries. Thank you, members. The paper's passed. Thank you.
members, I am conscious of the time. Uh, we have one last paper to go through with no deputations. Would you be happy to proceed uh, with and have lunch, a late lunch, so we can get through? Are we happy with that? Late lunch. Yes. Yep. Or okay, an early fine. tea. <laughs> and, and tea combined, yes. <coughs> then we're going to the last paper, which is um, change of use from agricultural land to form an extension to a car park at the McClure Arms Hotel and restaurant in McClure in Perth. And I'll ask Mrs. Condiff to introduce, please. Thank you, Vice Convener. Um, the proposal here is to in extend an existing car park. On the um, screen at the moment, it shows a large area, but the existing car park, if you see um, Summer Bank, the property to the top, to the north of the site, and the boundary of that where you see the red line, if you carry that red line forward towards the bottom of the page, southerly direction, is approximately where the existing car park is, so the new car park is everything in the field to the east of that. Um, th this is the existing access, you and this is the car park that I was explaining in the previous slide. So this is um, from Carsey Road. Um, the existing access would be retained, as would the beach hedge along the boundary and the existing mature trees that you see on that boundary. We'll go into the car park now in the next slide. And if you look to the, on front of the cars there into that field, that's the area that is proposed to extend the existing car park. And this is just another shot. And this is looking back to Summer Bank that we saw on that first slide. So you can see that the existing boundary runs in front of the cars there and the proposal is for the area beyond in, in the field. Um, this is the existing building of the McClure Arms Hotel and Restaurant. And at the moment, they use the car park that we just saw in the previous slides, plus this area in front of the um, building and an area to the rear of the building. Now, the aim of this proposal would be to get rid of this area here, which turns out to be quite dangerous because it looks on to the, uh, goes on to the A94, I think it is there, um, and people end up reversing onto the, the busier road. Um, this would take it away, and you'll see that there is a proposal to and a condition to remove the car park from this area and utilise the other area only. And this is back to the um, original slide. And you can see that the proposal there, that's all proposed tree planting around, and it's all of native species that is proposed to try and screen the car park to a large extent from the existing properties and also to create a feature in the middle with um, oak trees. Thank you. Thank you. We have no deputation, so are there any questions for officers? Councillor Anderson. Yes. If we were minded to grant this, uh, would this be classed as brownfield site for future, I presume, future developments? Yes, it would, because it would then be, it's obviously agricultural land, it's a field at the moment, it would become a hard standing as a car park. Any further questions? Okay, we'll go to debate then. Any comments? Shall I hear a motion? I'd like to move the report. Okay. Do we have a seconder? Thank you. Do we have any amendments? No. Any further comments? No. Then the paper's passed. Thank you. Now we have one last matter on here, which is a free application notice, um, which relates to the formation of an energy storage compound including 15 battery storage units, inverters and transformers, substation and ciliary work, and this will be at the southeast of Cooper Angus substation, <coughs> Pleasance Road, Cooper Angus. Uh, as I start this, I would mention that I've been advised there is a, to be a further consultation at the same venue as private, pri previously, uh, but on a ground floor level, which will allow more people to have access, and this will be taking place on the 19th of March. Are there any other comments that you need to make to officers? Councillor Anderson. It's point, pointed out to me at the first consultation there wasn't uh, much depth in what was uh, discussed and um, I've been asked to find out if uh, that uh, the further consultation if more detail was available so that um, you know it's if you're going to have a d consultation let's have it on everything laid out there as, if possible. I'm sure that'll be noted. 
Any other comments? Councillor Wilson? Just to follow on that in process terms, Vice Convener, it's important when the public consultations are accessible premises, they're well advertised and the people there are fully briefed on what the proposals are. There's no point in sending somebody along who is, is unable to answer the questions. And I think, um, I mean, these are all important things, but the whole planning process is based on front loading the discussion. Um, and you can't have a discussion with somebody who doesn't know what the, the, the issues and the facts are. So I, I don't know how we convey that message to the applicant, um, whether it's through our, our colleagues in planning or whether it's through any other process. But I would suggest that that message goes over. And just to support what Councillor Randall has said, that message is delivered clearly and concisely. And they've time to get their act together before the, the meeting. Uh, any comments from planning members? We're obviously in discussion with the um, proposed applicant for this proposal and what we will do following this meeting is take on board those comments and pass them across to the developer because I'm assuming the developer is not in the audience today. <coughs> and if that's the point, we'll close the meeting. Thank you very much, everybody, thank and thank you for your time today. <laughs>